May 10th, 2022 board meeting is now in order. I'm happy to welcome my fellow board members and the public. Mr. Gibbs, roll call, please. Ms. Belford. Present. Ms. McDougal. Present. Ms. Jenkins. Present. Ms. Campbell. Present. Mr. Susan. Present. The board will now hold a moment of silent reflection and invite the audience to join. Thank you. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I would like to offer my fellow board members and Dr. Mullins an opportunity to recognize students, staff, or members of the community who would like to start us off tonight. I'll go. Ms. Jenkins? Yeah, Sorry, I was just pull something up here. No worries. Um, so today, I had the privilege and honor of participating with Brevard Achievement Center's uh, <coughs> annual performance. Um, I actually got to perform with O'Galley High School's uh, two classrooms, which was really, really fun, and closed the show. But I just wanted to give a shout out to all of our schools that participated. So we had Johnson Middle, O'Galley High School, Kennedy Middle, Rockledge High, Central Middle, Stone Magnet Middle, Southwest Middle, and Space Coast Junior Senior. Uh, I want to give a shout out to all the people that were involved to put that on today. It was an amazing um, organization, uh, as well as the King Center who opened their doors to them. Uh, there was about 600 people in attendance, which is really, really cool for those, for those uh, students and the adults that participated. And I want to give a special shout out to one performance that uh, I was trying to watch on the sidelines as much as I possibly could, and um, she made me cry. <laughs> um, and Kelly Miller, she was a soloist, she was a singer, she sang uh, Miley Cyrus's The Climb, um, and I literally was just kind of sobbing on the sideline. I got to meet mom and uh, the director, Lee Sorensen, she used to be a ESC teacher for us here for Brevard Public Schools at Ocean Breeze Elementary. She is now working with Brevard Achievement Center. She gave me a little bit of a history of, um, of Kelly, and it's really, really miraculous and impressive, and that song is so fitting to who she was as a person. Uh, Lee met her when she was four years old in VPK at Ocean Breeze Elementary. She was a nonverbal student, and she moved on to Roy Allen to have a special program, and then eventually over into Satellite High School, where all of her music teachers kind of gravitated towards her passion for music and her ability to express herself through vocalizations um, and, and through performance. And um, hands down, I mean, she genuinely was a fantastic singer. And so that was the most moving performance and I was so, so grateful to be there. And again, thank you to Brevard Achievement Center for allowing us to be there. Um, Ms. Belford was there and Dr. Mullins was there as well. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, but uh, Dr. Mullins and I were speaking afterwards. I'm gonna throw this out there in the public. You know, how I like to hold you accountable there. Um, and we were discussing how it would be really interesting if we can try and fill the rest of that uh, performance hall next year by possibly figuring a way to incorporate some of our seniors at those schools that are participating to come support their peers, maybe go out to some of those assisted living facilities and kind of grab a bus and hop on with um, some of our seniors in the community, have them come out for that free performance and really support all of our kids in the community. So we'll see what we can do next year. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. Um, I, since while we're on that topic, I'll just throw it out there. Um, the other thing that I suggested to Dr. Mullins today as we were watching the performances, and, and Ms. Jenkins had the opportunity to, to participate in the O'Galley performance, which was really phenomenal. If you didn't get a chance to watch it, it's going to be on their website. Um, you should go and watch it because the message was just absolutely amazing and what all of us needs to hear. But I think it would be really fun if all of us joined in and performed with a group of students next year. So um, as we, yeah, drums or dancing or, you know, there were all sorts of different performances. So I think that would be a good thing. We you realize all... we're going to ruin the performance. Like, they're good. <laughs> they like, are really good. Really but we can good. be in the back. We okay. don't have to all be right, front I'm, I'm and center. Just, like, they're going to get angry at us for ruining their stuff. If we so hide in the back, it'll be fine. All right. Okay. I'm game. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. Mm -hmm. Who's next this evening? 
All right. Mr. Susan. Ms. Linderman, is Lind I think Linderman's back there. I saw him in there. Linderman, is he back there? He's in the hallway. He's in the hallway. Listen, um, just so you guys know, we had a situation where some of our tracks that um, we have going in, and everybody knows that right now we are refurbishing all of our tracks and putting them as rubberized over the next two years. Well, one of the problems we have is that in the infinite wisdom of some of the people that previously were inside the school district, they decided to put in seven track lanes as opposed to eight, which makes it very difficult to host FHSAA tournaments and stuff like that, which would have inhibited us. So at O'Galley High School, a group of parents called me last week it was and said, hey, Mr. Susan, did you know that they're, only, they're getting ready to resurface the track and they've only got seven lanes? And I lost my mind because I was like, how in the world are we going to inhibit somebody for the next 30 years on their tracks and not put eight lanes in there, right? So it caused all this commotion because of fun funding and you know where the stands sit and everything else. But lo and behold, what they found out was that um, FHSAA allows from 32 inches to 42 inches to be a, a train width, and we had 42 inches. We were able to reduce the size down to 39 and be able to get the eight lanes in. So many of you guys, um, you know, that's you know, like, oh gosh, that's common sense and stuff like that. But they literally had the parents at O'Galley not called. Um, Andrew Ramjet not jumped on it. Dr. Mullins, I called him immediately. He called uh, Lindemann. They all worked it out within two days. Now we have a solution. They'll have eight lanes and they'll be able to go. And there's been a solution for many of the other uh, schools that have the same issue, right? So um, hats off to Mr. Lindemann. Hats off to uh, Ramjet. Hats off to Dr. Mullins. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, the other thing I wanted to do is, is there was a group of teachers that met with me. Um, we have a, I, I always do this near the end of the year. I meet with them and say, hey, um, about 20 of them and said, just, just round table. How's it going in education? How's things going? Tell me how we can help. Tell me what we can do. Um, and I just want to say, I, they promised me not to say their names because for one reason or another, but I wanted to say thank you to them. Um, we all know that the current climate of education um, is not what it was a couple years ago and we're fighting and those teachers are on the front lines and I appreciate everything that those individuals brought to me and told me that we need to do improve for next year. So thank you very much and that's all I got. Thank you, Mr. Susan. Ms. Campbell? All right. Well, I have to start off, I'm so excited for you guys tonight. It's just going to be, we've got all these wonderful people out in the audience, and I'm so excited. So, but my first thing, I just have to take care of a piece of I'm business. Scared, like, what it's not alive. <laughs> so we just finished, at the end of April, the district-wide 300-mile walking challenge, and I challenged the board to get involved, and some of the people on the dais up here, um, you know, complied and got with it. But I have to say, we have to give uh, proper props are due. So, um, Mr. Gibbs, far and away, stomped all of us. Um, with the goal was six hundred thousand steps, which was about three hundred miles, right? The way they calculated it. He had, last I checked, 1,255,649 steps, which is the equivalent of 628 miles. So for winning at least the board uh, walking challenge, I present you with this gold shoe trophy. <laughs> Thank you for playing along. I won't ask for it back. Thank you. There we go. You have to keep it, and next year we'll pass it around. Um, the next thing I want, some of you saw in the news, um, a really scary situation that happened down in Palm Bay with a bus that caught fire. And, um, you know, we do, according to state law, we do a safety drills at the beginning of every year and the students practice exiting safely. And so one of our, I just wanted to give huge kudos to uh, Miss Janet, who is one of the bus drivers for Imagine Schools and one of our charter schools and the 40 students, elementary age students who were safely um, got off the bus, followed instructions, lives were saved. Um, I just want to congratulate them because, you know, this makes you want to go home and hug your kids a little tighter, what could have happened. So kudos to Ms. Janet, kudos to those 40 students um, and at Madden Schools. I know that school community was really um, thankful for all that, uh, that happened there. Um, Saturday, we recognized, we had our retiree lunch. I hope I'm not stealing your thunder. Am I? Okay. I'm going to steal it anyway. It was so exciting. And we recognize our retirees, and of course, we're sad to see people go, but it was exciting to see the years. We had more, you know, at least a thousand, wouldn't you say, years of experience collective. 
um, collectively. And we recognized three people in particular who were there who had the longest um, tenure in our district, and that was uh, Mr. Robin Novelli, who is the administrator with the most years of experience. We talked about him last time. Um, he's retiring this summer with 36 years in um, Brevard. We recognized Ms. Lisa Rogers, who is our teacher with the most years of experience, 42 years working with ESE students in our district. And then we recognize our support staff member with the most years of experience, and that was Gary Dean, also with 42 years. He has been a carpenter in the district the whole entire time. And so it's kind of like you never see NBA players stay with the same team through their whole careers. I mean, not only was with this the whole career, but was in the same position. So huge congratulations to those three and all of the others who were there that we were able to recognize. And then finally, um, on Thursday of last week, we had our final stop on the 2022 CTE tour, where we have been highlighting the career and technical programs all across our district. And we went to Heritage and, you know, go big blue, had a great time with some community members showing off our wonderful programs. Uh, we saw the very unique, one of only two and really the best one, the first one in the state, uh, water treatment programs. Uh, we saw um, a manufacturing program, and then we went to the um, medical, help me. DNA. The, yeah, where they get, their certification is a certified medical assistant, but they're working to be like a medical tech. And they were demonstrating the CPR skills that they have learned. They've already, all the students in that class had already gotten their CPR certification, and they were demonstrating it on a, like a doll, dummy, whatever you call it, model. <laughs> Not dummy, that's probably not the right term, but you know what I mean, not a real person. Um, and then they demonstrated it on a baby, and then Dr. Mullins asked this question. He said, have any of you in here had to use the skills you've learned doing this? And they all turned around to this one girl in the back, and actually Mr. Brun has a little video of what happened next. Bar road, and I witnessed a crash that happened in front of me, and of course I felt because you know it happened right in front of me. But once I realized that the man in the car, like he wasn't coming out the car, I went to go see and he was unresponsive. So I took him out the car, I checked for his pulse. There was no pulse, so I began CPR. Wow. So just, you know, did CPR on some random guy in an accident. I just, so you know, she saved that man's life. And this is, what our, this is what I have seen for me across our CTE programs. It's not just the skills they're getting, the confidence. Because I'm telling you what, as a 16, 17, eight year, 18 year old, I would have not had the confidence to, I would have been driving by, saying a prayer, whatever, but to think that not only do I have the skills, but I'm gonna put them into practice right now to actually pull someone out of a car, do CPR until the, um, the uh, EMTs came. It's amazing, so her name, is Tachani Forrest, and uh, we invited her to come so we could recognize her tonight, and she had a family situation where she couldn't come, but uh, definitely want to recognize her, uh, a student at Heritage High School, and her teacher, Miss Patricia Trotman, for um, the skills that she's imparted, and just, I knew you guys would love that story. I just have been thinking about it uh, since last week, so we're super proud of Tachani, who's not just, you know, getting those skills, but putting them to practice and having a huge impact on someone else's life. And she said, and he's good. He went to the hospital and he's fine. So even had been able to follow up. So congratulations to her and to the whole program for the good work that they're doing. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Great stuff. Ms. McDougall? I really don't have anything because Dr. Mullins is going to talk about all the good things in my district. <laughs> and I'm very excited for everybody in my district. So I'm going to let you do that. And with that, Dr. Mullins. Well, uh, first, I want to e echo the sentiments of Saturday's retiree celebration and add some additional recognition. If you can picture this room was converted into a hall of celebration. We had banners and we had balloons and we had uh, party favors and we had probably close to 100 people in the room. The honorees, those who are being recognized, they brought uh, loved ones with them, and we celebrated together just the collective service to Brevard's kids and, and Brevard's community. But an event like that is not possible without an amazing team of people who selflessly and behind the scenes commit themselves to making that possible. And 
that's kind of above and beyond because we don't have to do that kind of an event. It was on a Saturday. Uh, our, our food and nutrition services put together an absolutely wonderful brunch. Everything from biscuits and gravy to chicken and waffles and, um, and all of the sides and fresh fruit and so on. But also uh, our human resources team under the leadership of Dr. Thetty. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to the, the folks uh, who helped make Saturday possible. Heather, I'm not going to get Heather's last name right. Petetta? Petetas. Petapa, of course. Why didn't I get that? Um, Patty Snorf, Barbara Diaz, Kelly Harris, Riaf Mata, Fina Del Vecchio, uh, Patty Walter, Charmaine Odom, and Lisa Schmidt. And probably second to the retiree honorees, the man of the, the event was none other than our retirements specialist, uh, Carlos Lorenzo. When his name was recognized, everybody cheered. Imagine that. Um, he was the one who walked out very uh, explicitly with all of our retirees, all of their benefits in the future, uh, all, all of the process of Florida retirement system. He's just an amazing gentleman as well in, in supporting our, our staff. And then I'd also like to echo uh, Mrs. Jenkins' uh, shout outs to this afternoon's uh, event with Brevard Achievement Center. You know, our educators across this district who invest their hearts, their lives, themselves into our students with disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and so on, they are heroes in every definition of the word. And included in there, we can't forget our paraprofessional who come alongside and join our teachers in creating environments of love and acceptance and hope, encouragement, uh, not the least of which was just even in the auditorium. We had hundreds of students from across our schools who were chaperoned by our paraprofessionals because in some cases the teachers were up on stage with the students from that school. And I uh, just want to give equal recognition to not only our students who serve our students with disabilities, but also our uh, instructional assistants, our paraprofessionals who love on and serve our kids as well. And then co coincidentally, kind of in the, in the same lane, if you will, I had a story shared with me uh, last week about an unlikely hero among our ranks in the organization. A gentleman in our distribution services and procurement department. And you might be, how, okay, where is he going with that? So I'm going to read you the, a short synopsis of what happened when this gentleman was in one of our, our schools picking up computers that were being DCR'd or sent to the warehouse for processing because they were so old. And Mr. Cheatham will probably say, yeah, they're probably 14-year-old computers. But um, this is the account. I'm a speech-language pathologist. I was walking one of my nonverbal kids back to class when a very sweet gentleman who was helping DCR items saw the interest my student had with his task. My student kind of gets interested in lots of things going on around school. But anyway, your sweet employee started engaging in a conversation with my nonverbal student, asking him how he was and asking questions about the bunny project my, stu um, my student basically basically shoved in his face. <laughs> he then noticed the interest my student had with dumping the computers in the box, so he asked me if it was okay if he could give my student a cord to put in the box. You would have thought he was giving my student a million dollars. His face beamed. Your sweet employee then asked if my student was sensitive to noises. I said no. So then he proceeded to give two quick beep beeps on the utility dolly. I had my student use his device to interact and describe the event. I, can, I, I honestly cannot express how grateful I am to your employee. You see, we have been struggling to use my student's device in real life situations because he really was not motivated. But your employee interacted with him and gave him that spark and opportunity to use the device in a way 
that was meaningful. Please thank your employee for me and let him know how much his interaction with my student meant to me. I wish there were more people like this magnificent man who took just a few minutes of his time and most likely had no idea how much of an impact he made in that little boy's life. And I'll tell you that that individual is Mr. Jeff Williams from Procurement Distribution Services. So I want to give a huge shout out to Jeff for capitalizing on an opportunity to make a lasting impact in an unlikely student's life in that moment, in that time, and capitalizing it and making a difference in kids' lives. Jeff, hopefully you're out there uh, hearing tonight acknowledgement of your investment in kids' lives, not just behind the scenes picking up VCR computers, but seeing a young life that needs a little extra attention and needs your love. We appreciate you and uh, are thrilled that you're part of Team BPS and you exemplify that mission. Thank you. All right, I'm not sure that I can uh, show any of that up, but <laughs> um, do, do have a couple of recognitions. Um, every year, the city of Titusville reaches out to our schools on the north end of the county, and they ask the schools to identify students that they would like to be recognized by the city. Um, this event is awesome because it's not, some of the kids are the typical honor roll kids and the ones who get, you know, recognized on a pretty regular basis, but the majority of them are students that don't necessarily get recognized in a lot of the events that we currently have. Um, and they had every single school, and I want to say they had probably 15 to 20 students per school that they recognized um, for, you know, strong academics, commitment, good choices, those types of things. Um, so huge thank you to the city of Titusville for taking the time. The entire city council's there, the mayor's there, um, the city manager, they all invest in, in being there to congratulate and thank our kids for being awesome. So thanks to them for taking that time. Uh, we had our CTE tour at Titusville High School, uh, I think the day before yours, second to last for the season. Um, and I was not able to be there for the entire thing, but we had community members that came in and saw our cybersecurity program, our 911 dispatch program, the culinary program, the automotive program, and the CNA program. Um, and so, once again, feedback has just been phenomenal on those programs. And every time we walk through with someone, we see, you know, there's someone there that is already picking out employees to hire. So, um, has been a great thing. Thank you again, Mr. Susan, for getting that moving. Also have to give a huge thank you to the Propeller Club of Port Canaveral. Had an opportunity to join them for their uh, monthly luncheon last week. And they are big supporters of our HELM program at Rockledge High School, the HELM Maritime um, Studies program. And uh, the teacher for that program, Sarah Hardy, was there as well and spoke about the program, just kind of giving an overview to the Propeller Club um, members. But they also gave out, I think, five scholarships to our students, who are three of them are graduating seniors, varying amounts of scholarships. One of them was recurring for four years. One was a one-time, and so it, it ran the full gamut. And then also at that luncheon gave $3,500 to Ms. Hardy for support of the home program at Rockledge High School. So, um, you know, I talk all the time about how much community support we have coming into our schools and how much we appreciate that, and I think that was just a a glaring example. Um, and then I also, uh, along kind of the same vein as the, the community support, you know, teacher appreciation has been this month and mostly focused on this week. And as I see all of our schools posting, there have been so many organizations that have come together to appreciate our teachers. Um, and many of them, I, you know, I, we, we talk about life in the North End is, is different sometimes because we don't have a lot of the big businesses and those types of things. So many of the organizations that are supporting our schools to show appreciation for our teachers, at least up on that end, are small mom and pop type stores. Um, and we know, you know, the struggles that businesses have had over the past couple years, but they still are digging deep and doing great things for our schools. So thank you to all of those um, who have supported both, you know, volunteers and businesses that have contributed to uh, recognition of our teachers this week. It's greatly appreciated. And then the last one, this is one that I'm really excited about, um, and I don't mean to steal your thunder, Miss Campbell, since you are part of SIAC, but 
Um, a while back, you know, we constantly talk about how we have so many struggles with our health insurance trust fund and that uh, our employees just don't understand how the health choices that they make, everything from making healthy choices to the doctors that they choose or where they go for imaging or blood work or any of those things, impact the health insurance trust fund, which also impacts the amount of money that we have available for raises and those types of things. So I mentioned to a couple of people um, that I thought it would be great if we had a podcast that would just give snippets about how our employees can make better choices to positively impact that health trust fund um, and impact their well-being on top of it, you know, financially and otherwise. And the first podcast came out the end of April um, during our wellness week. It was introducing all of the wellness activities that we had for that week. And so I encourage all of our employees, especially if you're on the health plan, but even if you're not, um, to take the time. It's on Spotify. Go and listen to that podcast and make sure that you're keeping up to date with them because there really are a ton of ways that we as individuals can impact the health of that trust fund and um, you know, also impact the amount of money that we have available to compensate employees instead of funding the health insurance trust fund. So thank you to Dr. Fetty and to Mr. Brune and to Dr. Mullins who um, very expeditiously pulled that together. I appreciate it very much. Of course, Ms. Dinkins. I forgot one thing. Um, so I received in the mail a letter um, from Congressman Bill Posey making me aware of the three students in my district that are um, going to be honored with the Congressional Medal of Merit Award on May 24th. So I just want to throw that in there because our meeting's that evening. Um, and we, I've got Courtney Antolochi from Palm Bay Magnet High School, Neil Reddy from Satellite High School, and Lily Winston from West Shore Junior Senior High School. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. If I can get a second. Um, I forgot to say, one of the things that came out of the jobs program recently, and I forgot about it, we met yesterday. Um, I sit on the, as the executive board on the Economic Development Council, and one of the things we do is, is we're the ones that set conditions for companies to come in and work inside this community. So that's all the aviation industry and everybody else. I mean, we're working on probably six of them right now. And one of the things that they look at is no longer are they looking for tax incentives. They don't care about that. What they're really looking for is workforce. Many of them have relocated to places throughout the United States and they get there, they don't have the workforce, they have to shut down their production and everything else is, is poor. So what they did was we put together a rapid task force. It's, um, it's gonna be myself, uh, Jack Parker from Eastern Florida State College, uh, Dr. Mullins hasn't said he's going to be a part of it yet, but I'm going to kind of ask him right now. Um, we also have Mike, Mike Ennis from L3 Harris, for, former director of L3 Harris, and a couple other groups that what we're going to do is meet real quick and create that pipeline because we have kids both from middle school to high school, then to college, we can set up pipeline programs to exactly tie into whatever company's coming. Many of them are going to be communications and aerospace, which we already have infrastructure for, but we're uniquely designed inside this county that we don't have one big trade school in the middle of the state in the county. We can build and, and spin programs in different areas to fit where those locations are happening. And there's all kinds of Brownsfield developments and all kinds of opportunities throughout our um, county for these places to move. And if we can put a rapid response program to pipe feed in there, it's going to be good. So I just want to let you guys know that uh, Dr. Mullins agreed to uh, be a part of the program. And uh, we got some things going on. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Susan. All right, I believe that we are now at the adoption of the agenda, Dr. Mullins. Ms. Belford and members of the board, on this evening's agenda, we have administrative staff recommendations, one presentation, 17 consent items, three public hearings, two action items, and two information items, and two board member reports or discussions, uh, discussion points. Changes made to the agenda since released to the public include revisions to A7 administrative staff recommendations, D8 superintendent report, DTE tour wrap up, F14 reappointment nominations of continuing professional service contract teachers for 2022-2023, and H32 department school initiated agreements, and the additions of K35, the SHAC committee, Update and K36 at large versus single district. I'll entertain a motion. Move. Second. 
Moved by Ms. McDougall, seconded by Ms. Campbell. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. The motion passes 5-0. Dr. Mullins, will you please let us know about the administrative staff recommendations for this evening? Yes, Ms. Belford and members of the board, this evening there are 15 items for your consideration. What are the wishes of the board? To approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. McDougall. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please think. Oh, oh Ms. Sorry. McDougall, go ahead. I just want to say that District 2 is making out like bandits, and I'm so excited um, for the people that are coming and going and having promotions, and I'm going to miss a couple people, but I'll still get to see them, so I'm very excited. Any other discussion? All right, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. And the motion passes 5-0. Dr. Mullins. Well, I would like to take this opportunity, and it's going to take a few minutes, because we've got quite a, a lineup of new leaders. Well, some of them not so new, but leaders uh, rising into new ranks of leadership across our district. So first, I'd like to uh, very happily and, and pleased to announce the reclassification from principal at Coco High School to Chief Operating Officer, effective June 13th, Mr. Rashad Wilson. Good evening, Board and Superintendent Mullins. And uh, Dr. Mullins, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to sit on your cabinet. I'm looking forward to the journey. I know it's going to be a challenge, but I think I've, my journey has afforded me some tough skin to bear to bear all. To my cabinet, my new team, my new cabinet members, I'm looking forward to working alongside with you, rolling up my sleeves and getting in where I fit in. And um, wherever that may be, I guess I'll find out here soon enough. Um, Ms. Bowman, thank you for being an awesome director. Um, you've been my, I've been blessed to have you from the time that I've been a principal and you have afforded me the opportunity to grow. And I appreciate you, young lady. Um, to my Cocoa High team, Ms. Stewart and everybody else, Ms. Albright, I uh, appreciate you guys. Um, it's been a good ride. Uh, the, school, the school's in great hands under your leadership, but I'm not going to steal your thunder. And uh, to my <laughs> wife and my two daughters, thank you um, for being patient with me as I, uh, you know, this past weekend, I had a very big project that I had, and um, that, but, was my, that was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate your patience. Um, I, I love you guys, and my youngest daughter. I have to admit, she she's a little upset because she said that she can't go to Cocoa High no more on Sundays when I go to work and run the hills while I'm out there working. <laughs> so so maybe Miss Stewart will allow us to come out there every now and then and run up some hill, run up and down some hills. Um, to my mom, to my brother, I appreciate it. Um, this journey started with this lady. Looking <laughs> <laughs> like a mom. Love you. Thank you. Dr. Mullins, can I say something real quick? I wanted to say, um, you know, I had, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, I had a problem with you getting the job, not because of anything else, but because you're a former, former Gator. And, um, <laughs> oh, you're not. Okay, that's what was told. That's what it was. That's what it was. Um, no, but I, Rashad, I, I did want to take a second and tell you, um, you come highly recommended by all your colleagues. And everything that I've seen, what you did in Coco, we are blessed to have you as an individual up here in this district. I think you're going to do great things here, and I look forward to working with you. Um, I've never seen anything but class come out of your school. I think you do a great job, and I think that, that we're going to see great things happening here. Um, I've got a list of projects already I'd like you to approve. <laughs> All right. right here. June but, 13th. Man, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Yes, sir. And Mr. Wilson, I will just say that one of the first requirements of your job is the ability to say no to Mr. Susan on all of those projects, okay? Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, next, I would like to extend congratulations and uh, uh, to Ms. Heather Smith, who was reclassed from assistant principal at Vieira High School to principal at Central Middle School, effective July 1. But interestingly, her journey as principal starts now because she's also serving as acting principal at Vieira High School uh, from now through June 17th, while Miss Sarah Robinson is out on maternity leave. And yesterday, we just had a new BPS uh, recruit join us. Uh, Miss Robinson had a little girl named Madeline, uh, otherwise known as Maddie. But we won't let her steal the, the show. Um, Heather, congratulations, and uh, appreciate your leadership. Thank you, Dr. Mullins. Thank you to the board. I am super excited to be an Eagle. I've been an Eagle parent uh, since 2014, so I'm super excited to take this journey, um, and thank you for entrusting me with Central Middle School. I have so many people to thank on my leadership journey, Dr. Sullivan, uh, Chris Moore, Lena Weibelt, Sherry Bowman, uh, Molly Vega have all been instrumental, Mike Alba, uh, wow, the list goes on. Uh, so many great people at BPS that are always supportive. My colleagues, Denise, um, I'm super excited for you. Uh, my husband, who's here, my, um, my, my kiddos, my family are all supportive of my Saturday ventures or Sunday ventures to work. Um, so hopefully, you know, they'll keep supporting me through that. Um, I really want to thank my VHS team. So I have my team here with me, some of them. We're able to come tonight, and I'm super thankful for them. Sad Mrs. Robinson can't be here, but I know she wants to be here. She's watching live stream, so more baby pictures, please. Um, and I'm just really thankful for all of the people I've gotten to work with at VHS. It's a great team. I know that they're in great hands. And um, my central family, I'm super excited to work with everyone and to just be a part of the central team. So go Eagles. Next Dr. Mullins, I, I wanted to say, um, Heather, thank you for everything that you did in our district. Um, sorry that I'm, you know, doing this a second time, but Heather, I don't care. Like, Heather was in my district, man. Um, Heather, thank you. I want everybody to know I would go over there to visit uh, Vera High School. I would, you know, my character, I would walk around. Hey, guys, how you doing? She's like, okay, this is what you need to do. This is what you got to do. I mean, she keeps, she keeps, she runs a tight ship, and I think she's going to do an amazing job down there in, in Central, and I really appreciate everything you've done for us here. Good luck. I promise that's it. Sorry, Wait, let me see. I, I don't, I'm not sure what else we got on here. Now it is my uh, uh, privilege and, and honor to introduce and welcome, congratulate Dr. Stephen Richardson, appointed as principal at McNair Magnet Middle School, effective July 1st. Welcome to Brevard, Dr. Richardson, and uh, we are thrilled that you're able to join us this evening. I. I didn't anticipate making a speech, so I didn't prepare anything, but um, I do live by the philosophy of to whom much is given, much is required, and I certainly don't take it lightly. The opportunity to lead children, um, to lead young people, it has been a passion of mine. I will tell you that the Brevard family has been extremely welcoming. Um, they've been extremely supportive already. Um, coming in, I, I talked to Dr. Sullivan, and told her at the time I had three offers to lead a school, but this just felt like home. And so I'm just ecstatic to be here. I certainly appreciate the opportunity, and I guarantee you um, McNair Magnet will be an A school <laughs> come moving forward. So I appreciate the welcome. I'm just looking forward to working with everybody. Next, I would like to congratulate and announce uh, Denise Stewart, reclass from assistant principal at Coco High School to head Tiger principal, Coco High School, effective June 13th. Thank you, thank you. First of all, I just want to say on our drive over here, my daughter can attest, I of the Tiger was playing. So <laughs> I think that's a positive. Um, I don't want to leave anybody out, so I did write a couple words, but thank you first, of course, to the school board, Dr. Mullins and Dr. Sullivan, for giving me the opportunity to continue to serve Coco High School and Brevard Public Schools as principal. I value the trust and faith your selection represents. I am truly humbled by it. 
Thank you to the many Brevard leaders who have helped guide and support me during my leadership journey. Um, literally, there are too many to um, acknowledge, but I absolutely want to acknowledge the three directors back here because their phone numbers are on speed dial, and, and I could not be more thankful for that. Um, a special thank you, very special thank you, to Mr. Rashad Wilson for his mentorship during my tenure as assistant principal at Coco High School. I've said it often, and I'll continue to say it forever. He gave me the keys and said, go at it. I believe in you, and I have faith in you. And that has brought me here today, and I appreciate that. And finally, thank you to my family. I have my, one of my daughters, another daughter is in Jacksonville watching live streaming, and my son here with me, as well as my in-laws, um, for their continued love. And my children's pride in the work that I do is absolutely a motivator to me. I'm grateful to be able to continue to work in partnership with the parents, community, and staff at Coco High for the benefit of our students. At Coco High, we rise together towards excellence, and if you know, you know, Tiger Pride. <laughs> Next, a huge congratulations to Ms. Pam Albright, reclass from teacher at Coco High to assistant principal dean at Jefferson Middle School, effective August 2nd. Congratulations. Good evening, Dr. Mullins, board. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Um, from the bottom of my heart, it means the world to me. Dr. Sullivan, you started off as my mentor and given me all the different opportunities to become a leader, and I appreciate every one of those opportunities. Mr. Wilson, when she left, you took over, and I thank you for the opportunities you gave me to help me grow, not only as a person, but also as a leader. And Ms. Chime, thank you so much for putting me on your list and seeing just what I can bring to Jefferson, and I welcome it as my new home and I just appreciate every bit of it. My husband, I thank you for this crazy adventure and going through all the sleepless nights and just being there as my biggest cheerleader. And I thank my children for putting up with everything that I threw at them and the extra responsibility so I could make them proud of me. Bavard County is my home, born and raised, and I just am honored to continue to serve it the students, and the staff, and the community. Thank you. Next, we want to welcome and acknowledge Ms. Joanne P Patterson, reclassed from teacher at McNair Middle to assistant principal dean at Hoover Middle School, effective August 2nd. Congratulations, Joanne. Thank you very much. First and foremost, I would like to thank Jasmine DeLauder for her leadership at McNair and for her mentorship. Without her, none of this would have been possible for me. She came into McNair and she really showed what great leadership is. And I congratulate her on her move. Secondly, without a cheerleader behind me, um, my best friend, Carrie Fowler, he was there when I started my master's degree, and I learned how to turn on a computer. And she encouraged me through and through my ed specialist degree. And without her, I don't know how I would have survived it. Talking about not being able to survive it, my husband, he has supported me when I need my time. He gives it to me. And when I need his support, he gives it to me. And he's always there to rub my feet for me at the end of a very long day. <laughs> Last but not least, I want to thank my son. I'm so proud of him. He is my joy. He is my light. And he is so proud of me. He just graduated Vieira High School. And the first thing he wanted to do was tell his friends that I was going to be a dean in Brevard Public Schools. So the fact that a recent graduate is proud of his mother for her achievement within the district, that says a lot about us as a whole. So thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to working with you too. I can't wait. Catherine, thank you so much, and Brian, thank you so much. Ms. Patterson, what is your husband's first name? Gordon. 
nice. <laughs> You've got all the other husbands in the room in trouble right now. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, congratulate and, and welcome to uh, uh, Mr. Brian Irvine, classified from teacher on assignment at Stone Middle School to assistant principal dean at Southwest Middle School, effective August 2nd. Congratulations, Brian. Thank you. I don't know how I follow the foot rub, but I'm in trouble and you, I'm nervous now. Uh, board, superintendent, I want to thank you for this opportunity. I feel very privileged to be part of Rivard Public Schools. Um, I think this is probably destiny for me to be here. I have never in my life been a Bronco in my educational life. And because I am an, I'm not a Gator, I'm an Oklahoma State Cowboy. So that's why being a Bronco is probably a good thing. <laughs> But again, I want to thank everybody for this opportunity, uh, Ms. Vega and Ms. Lundy, right now for helping me uh, get to where I am right now. Thank you very much. Mr. Irvine, just remember, those of us who have left part of our heart and soul at uh, Southwest through our own administrative journey, it's not just Southwest Middle School. What is it? Great. The Great Southwest. That's right. Yes, sir. Um, all right. Uh, I think this is the last one for now. I want to congratulate and welcome uh, Ms. Melissa Rivera Arazo, classified from teacher at South Area Alternative Learning Center to assistant principal at the Great Southwest Middle, effective August 2nd. Congratulations, Melissa. First of all, yay. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here. Um, super grateful to be here. Um, I'd like to start by thanking my leadership team, um, Misty Bland and Mr. Sejek for being here and um, for guiding me and supporting me along the way. Um, for all of my cheerleaders, including my family, my mom and dad, um, my boyfriend for putting up with me, um, all those conversations about, oh my God, am I going to get the job? Or, you know, all the interview questions I probably threw at him. Um, <laughs> all my colleagues, my friends. Um, the hiring committee. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I look forward to serving the students at Southwest and for following some of them back from the ALC and making sure that they um, get to high school and are very successful. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I may just make a couple more comments. I, I can't pass up the opportunity to, to really recognize you heard uh, all of our uh, leaders moving into new areas of responsibility acknowledge and recognize uh, those men and women who have helped them on their journey as mentors along the way. And I want to commend Brevard Public Schools leadership team. You are a most impressive group of leaders yourself to raise up and help and support our next leaders. And I am enormously proud to serve as your superintendent, knowing that not just today's leaders, but tomorrow's leaders are in great hands. And second, if you've been in administration for a day or a decade, you can't do it without the loving support and devotion and patience and tolerance of the loved ones at home because it takes far more than a nine to five commitment to serve the children in the community of Brevard like this mission charges us to. And to the wives and the husbands and the children and the moms and the families of those who are serving our schools, I thank you from every depth of my heart for the sacrifices you make to raise up these incredible leaders to serve the children of Brevard. Thank you for being part of Brevard Public Schools family and uh, giving us a part of your family to serve our kids. We appreciate you. you. All right. I think we are now going to uh, transition into the superintendent report on CTE tour wrap up. Dr. Mullins? Mullins, you want to give them a minute so they can all leave? Sure. All right. Yes, for those of you who joined us this evening for appointments, you are welcome to go ahead and exit now if you would like. We're not running you off. You're welcome to stay too if you'd like. 
but uh, I have a feeling there's some celebration to be had. Revenue greater shows. Period. I have no idea why she's asking this.
All right, Madam Chair and members of the board, thank you for your patience. I don't know. That kind of felt like a family reunion. I think we're just uh, <laughs> enjoying the opportunity to be back together and What's to celebrate our upcoming and aspiring on? leaders. But um, thank you for the opportunity it. to send them off and uh, with congratulations. You know, um, I am thrilled to bring tonight's superintendent's report, kind of the closure, at least for this year, but I think we may have started something uh, that we're gonna need to continue. And that is our career and technical education tour uh, across our district this year. You hear the crowd? The, the crowd goes wild, that's right. This is a big um, deal, big deal right here. All right, that's right, Sorry. that's right. <laughs> but I gotta tell you, um, yeah! There we go. I'll let, I'll let it start with, uh, with the highlight video. <laughs> See if you recognize some of the students we hung out with over the last few months. Just for the viewing audience, these are our kids and our programs. These are not like uh, what are they called? Uh, royalty free the uh, So uh, those are the highlights from our, our tour uh, from over the last, I guess, almost three, three months. Um, you know, I was a little intimidated to come and do the, the CTE tour because the last time we presented our career and technical education program to the board, Ms. Rutledge came up, right? And <laughs> she was so amazing. The enthusiasm, you know, that Southern accent didn't hurt either. And I got none of that. But uh, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to live up to, to the standard she set a few months ago. But uh, so I'm going to try and make you proud, Ms. Rutledge. But you can see we had a, a very ambitious schedule across the district. Uh, but I got to tell you, it was the funnest things that were on my calendar throughout, throughout these months. And I want to commend the board. Every board member participated in tours across our district and, and recruited participants to be a part of it as well. Thank you for your support of our career and technical education programs, not just uh, in making the, the important decisions and the priorities of budget and so on, but also boots on the ground out in our community to celebrate these programs. Here you see all the, uh, just, a, just a smattering of the programs that we highlighted over the last several weeks. We saw culinary arts, business and finance, air conditioning, refrigeration and heating technology, IT programs like cybersecurity, web application development, programming, drafting, teach our teaching academies, robotics, gaming, simulation, public service programs like criminal justice, 911, public safety telecommunications, um, early sneak peeks of our firefighting program I'll talk about a little bit more soon. Our early childhood education program, I got to do a pause right here. Uh, that was probably one of the what I, I'm very familiar with our programs across the district, but honestly, I don't know that I had visited our early childhood programs in a very long time. And we visited Satellite High School, the teacher there, and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna remember her name off the top of my head. She is phenomenal. Uh, I've met four seniors, who, who was, Mrs. Jenkins, I think you were with me. We met uh, four seniors that were working on lesson plans to deliver those plans to our little three and four year olds the following week while a cohort of students were delivering their lesson plans from the previous week with the kiddos. I was so impressed with these seniors. 
I said, you will be getting a letter from me guaranteeing you a job when you finish college. And I followed through and those seniors have received their letter of commitment to join Team BPS and be teachers in our, in our system. And they didn't believe me at first, like I, like I could do that. I said, you're gonna get, you're gonna get letterhead, it's, it's official. So um, they were pretty thrilled and uh, the teacher is doing a phenomenal job. But we also visited our medical administrative specialist program, welding. Uh, you've already heard about the healthcare programs, nursing, dental aid, exercise science, construction, aviation assembly and fabrication. And that's probably only a third of the programs that we have available for our students. We have on our website, each one of these uh, pictures is connected with a highlight video from the tour. I think we've got Mr. Brune, 14 different highlight. Where did he go? 14 different highlight videos. So if you miss the tour in person, you can live it virtually uh, through these different programs. So you might ask, well, what was the benefit? What was the return on investment in this time and going out? Look at some of these numbers. We set out to make our CTE no longer the best kept secret in Brevard. And I think we've put a great dent in that commitment. Over 120 businesses and community partners attended across Brevard. We added eight more student internship sponsors. We had over 200 follow-up post-tour contacts for, from folks who attended, but also those who didn't attend because we sent the highlight video out to the entire invitee list, even those who couldn't be there. And of course, we've got our marketing videos that we're gonna continue to utilize. This is likely a slide that you're, you're familiar with because we brag on our community <laughs> partners and these are uh, a list of, or a snapshot of the community partners, business partners that we have coming alongside our, our CTE programs and are in partnership with us. But here's what's awesome about the tours. We added these partners as well, and they've now joined Team BPS in supporting our students in these programs. And I've got to give a particular shout out to Space Coast Association of Realtors. They attended every tour across Brevard. They had a representative at all 14 tours. So a huge shout out to our partners, uh, Space Coast Realtors Association. We are thrilled that uh, you are coming alongside our, our CTE programs. So what's next? Are we done? Have we arrived? Are we, are we settling in with what we have? Absolutely not. So thrilled to uh, share that progress toward launching our firefighting program at Palm Bay Magnet High this coming school year. The, the uh, plan is well underway and we're excited to be launching our firefighting one, two, and two, uh, three high school courses next year, as well as dual enrollment courses to partner that at Eastern Florida. We've got a great partnership with not only the Palm Bay Fire Department, Melbourne Fire Department, but also the county and their firefighting uh, program department as well. And of course, that will come with cert uh, industry certifications that include CPR first aid, as well as the Firefighter One course once a student turns 18. So uh, we got a little bit of a sneak peek. Students are gonna be interacting with uh, uh, firefighters across the district. I gotta tell you, we got a winner, winner chicken dinner of a teacher, instructor at the firefighter program. He's actually the husband of one of our current educators. I think his wife is at Dr. Sullivan Stone. Stone. Yeah, and uh, she helped recruit him quickly out of firefighting retirement. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he's just a real dynamic, in engaging uh, individual. Our kids are gonna be in great hands as they start the program next year. And then uh, on the horizon next is we're developing a carpentry program at Vieira High School. Uh, that's gonna be supported through the new building that we're adding to Vieira High School for school year 23-24. It'll include a hands-on <laughs> curriculum fo focusing on those uh, carpentry skills such as building materials, site preparation, building codes, and essentially the installation of all the components of a dwelling or structure. You can imagine our contractors around us are salivating, waiting to get their hands 
on our uh, kids who come out of this program because we know that the workforce shortage in the areas of construction is, is real. So next, I'd like to share with you actually a video that was produced by one of our CTE interns in um, the um, CTE department. So here's a little highlight video of our firefighter program. We're gonna have lots of hands. Now we are building um, lots of both classroom and lab environments here for Palm Bay Magnet High School. And so our students are gonna have the opportunity to work directly with um, firefighters from the community that, that actually serve Bavard County. Um, the main goal of our program is basically to support and recruit individuals that potentially might want to <clears throat> pursue a career in, in firefighting and, and those kind of related service industries. It's going to give the opportunity for, for students to not have to wait until college to actually start experiencing some of these things and to, and to get involved at an earlier age and, and make a decision whether this is something that they might want to be involved in. We're just excited to have the opportunity here at Palm Bay Magnet High School. We think that it's going to be uh, a, a unique program. It's the only one, as I mentioned, in Bavard Public Schools, and it's going to provide and fill a, a void that has, that has existed in BPS for the student opportunity. And, and I think a lot of the students are going to be excited about, about the options, and I think that it's going to be a, a very fulfilling experience for any students who choose to go that route. So next year's tour will include a full-blown uh, introduction to our firefighting program at Palm Bay Magnet High. We are also so excited about a, uh, a new program in development right now that will launch in 23-24 at Cocoa Beach Junior Senior High School, and it is an aquaculture ecology restoration program. I don't know that there could be a more appropriate school for this <laughs> program to be at when Cocoa Beach backs up to the Indian River Lagoon and the canals up in, uh, in Cocoa Beach. And so this will be a very science-rich curriculum. We're looking to put an outdoor classroom right there on the school property, out by the, um, uh, the canal, the lagoon, where our students literally get in the water, they interact with that natural resource, uh, the wetlands, they explore, study, and apply the skills of aquaculture and, and wire, water resources, biotechnology. Um, if you will, you could say that BPS and our students will be joining Brevard's force to restore our amazing natural resources. So these students will be cultivating oysters, clams, seagrass, man, mangroves, um, ultimately the natural cleaners of the Indian River Lagoon. And then, to take it even to the next level, the Brevard Zoo is already committed to partner with us, bring their experts in natural resources and, and study and ecology to our kids. And when they open the aquatic center up at the port, our kids will interact there and they'll cultivate these different um, aspects of, of cleaners for the, for the lagoon. And Brevard's uh, Brevard, uh, Cocoa Beach's program and the Brevard Zoo uh, Aquatic Center will literally be a destination reality because uh, the aqua center in the, at the port will be the only aqua center south of Charleston, South Carolina in the northeast, or excuse me, the southeast. So we're very excited about the uh, application, the relevance of this program, and what it's going to offer for our students in the very, very near future. Just so you know, our, um, our amazing secondary team and our CTE team uh, continue to pursue and uh, look for grant opportunities to support CTE. You can see a list here uh, that we've already uh, recognized, acknowledged, but I don't think we can to, uh, enough. The grant that we received from District 5 Commissioner, uh, Chairman of the, of the County Commission, Christine Zonka, uh, contributed $700,000 to Brevard's, Brevard Public Schools Career and Technical Education programs in partnership with Junior Achievement, uh, as well as we received additional entrepreneurship grant. So ultimately, our priority is to continue to eliminate any financial or transportation barrier for a student to have full access to all of our programs across Brevard and to provide a pathway to, to viable 
meaningful, rewarding career opportunities right here in our community. We love to keep every one of our graduates close to home, and I know our parents, I suspect, would like us to as well. So you may ask, does CTE end, start and end in our high schools? Well, maybe in some places across Florida and the United States, but not in Brevard Public Schools, because career and technical education is not only alive and well in high school, but in our middle school where we offer coding, as well as we launched this year 16 elementary schools offering digital tools. And you can see a picture there of our first cohort of elementary students who earned their digital tools endorsement. And uh, so impressive. I think Cambridge Elementary School uh, had our first group of students who received that designation. Cape View was right after that. So I need to recognize our teachers, Darlene Wegner at Cambridge, uh, Miss Lauren Castaldo at Cape View, uh, Carrie Roeder at Ocean Breeze and at Stevenson Elementary, Ms. Mon uh, Jennifer Monroe, all uh, helped their students prepare for that digital tools uh, endorsement and we're proud of them for that accomplishment. Got to give a shout out to a Delora student, uh, Samuel Shuster, who received a perfect score on his MS Excel and MS Word certification. Perfect score. Uh, congratulations to Samuel, but also a huge shout out to uh, Miss Judith Robert, his teacher, who helped him be ready. So what are some of the other accomplishments and, and points of pride of our CTE programs? Well, uh, in school year 2021, I think the board has seen these, uh, these numbers before, but over 4,100 industry certifications earned, uh, over 4,900 digital tools earned, and then uh, this current year, we have made significant growth in the number of internships available for our students and that students are taking advantage of. We have in this year alone exceeded the number of student internship opportunities compared to the last seven years combined. That is awesome. And we have already 80 student applicants for next year. So uh, one of the asks I made during the tour of our community partners that came along, I, I said two things. I'll put dinner on the line that if you are not wowed by the time you leave, I'll, I owe you dinner. I have yet any community member to take me up on that, so we'll see if I don't get my phone doesn't start blowing up uh, now that I've proclaimed it again. But uh, the fact of the matter is our, our community partners were in fact very wowed. I asked them then to take that experience out into their sphere of influence to be ambassadors for our career and technical education programs and break down that reality that it's the best kept secret in Brevard. We want it to be the greatest point of pride for our students and our community. And then the second ask was, be thinking about a student internship opportunity in your places of work, or perhaps your family's places of work, or wherever your sphere of influence is, because we want our kids, every one of our CTE pathway pursuing students to have a workplace experience by the time they graduate from high school. So not only they have had a, 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 a quality path toward college and access to college, but also a quality path to a career after high school through one of our CTE programs partnered with continued education. I'll tell you another exciting um, development in our CTE um, office in partnership with Eastern Florida State College. Eastern Florida is helping com uh, compile or develop a, a companion sheet for every one of their programs aligned with our preparation program so that our kids, when they're in our programs, know what the continuing education opportunity is for that career. This one uh, is, is focused on applied engineering technology. So it shows, okay, where do you start in Brevard Public Schools? Well, in our Applied Engineering one Technology 1, 2, 3 courses, and then where do you go next? And it takes them to what they would participate in at Eastern Florida State College. So our kids know that that, that continuous learning doesn't end when they leave high school, 
to really attain and obtain all of the potential that's available to them. So here is a quick snapshot and shout out to our current student internship business partners, where our kids are right now across Brevard County. And I would uh, be remiss if I didn't highlight the icon that's in the middle of this picture. Why? <clears throat> because our Brevard Public Schools has the highest number of student interns across our organization right now of all those that are represented there. And we're very proud to lead by example and have our students be a part of our government communications department, our maintenance and HVAC department, our transportation department, uh, our uh, CTE department, all across Brevard schools. We're very proud that our kids are being paid to be interns in our own departments across the organization. So with that, hopefully I lived up to the Rachel Rutledge enthusiasm for career and technical education. Um, I won't be too offended if you say I'm close, but not quite there yet because it's hard to live up to uh, the bar she set. So, but I'm happy to answer any questions the board may have. And if you ask some hard ones, I have Rachel close by. <laughs> any board members have any questions or comments for Dr. Long? Ms. Campbell. Um, you know, I was just taking a look at some of the companies that are offering internships because some of them I'm not familiar with and we're, you know, some of them are clearly dental programs, medical programs, but architecture and engineering firms, construction firms, um, you know, I'm not sure what they're doing at the, the racing program. I'm, some of our automotive programs, pretty awesome opportunities. So it's, it's exciting. I see a few fields that are missing. So I know we're, we're relentless and I think we've got Grace back there yes. who is coordinating all our internships and that has been such a such a benefit to the program so to all of our programs to get these kids into their internships you know one of the things you know I've heard you give this speech so I'm going to toss you an easy question Dr. Mullen um, you know somebody might say well my child wants to be in really wants to do this post high school but that program's not at their offer at their local school um, I know that you know. Obviously, they can they can do the choice options to go to a different school. But what if it's too far away? It, what kind of things are there going to be programs that are similar in their zone school that could maybe accomplish the same thing, even if they don't have the exact program they're looking for in their current school? Yeah, we have open enrollment to all of our schools, and students can uh, uh, apply to be part of a program at another high school. So the programs are accessible across Brevard for students. But I would suggest if geography becomes a potential challenge, that there are transferable programs or aligned programs that it may not be exact, but it comes alongside. Um, we provide access to the industry certification exams for students across schools. You'll, the board will remember the young man at Palm Bay Magnet High School who graduated with 21 industry certifications. Uh, at the end of high school. Those were all made available and paid for uh, through Brevard Public Schools for that young man. And that same opportunity is available to all of our kids uh, across Brevard. So if a student is wrestling with or has questions about, again, we have an amazing team that will work with them, connect with the schools that they're thinking about and help them uh, make the best decision for them. And I, you know, what we see is, is that CTE is not just for kids who are strictly career pursuing. We have many, excuse me, many, many students who are college pursuing who take CTE and they have the opportunity to see the uh, relevance of what they're learning in the classroom and their subject areas and apply it to the CTE industries. So uh, we have historically had over 40% of our High school seniors graduate with an, at least one industry certification. Don't have quite the uh, data yet for this year, but I suspect it's going to uh, at least meet, if not exceed, our historical 40 plus percent of who graduate. Thank you, Dr. Mullen and Ms. Campbell. Anyone else? My turn. Okay. So I. Um, there's an airport right up here in Titusville, actually, and one of the people that run the FBO are from um, outside this country, and they're from Europe, and they sit there and talk about, every time I'm inside there, they say, you right now, Americans don't understand that it's our duty to help the next generation. 
we are selfish as an organization. We are selfish people. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to places and said, you guys should hire an intern. And they say, oh, well, you know, I got to train them. I got to do, yeah, that's what we should do as a community. Um, the problem is, is that these people say, well, you know, I'm too busy. I'm too this. Well, the hell with you. Because we can't train our future workforce. We won't have a future as a country. And so some of these people need to step up to the plate. Um, one of the things I'd like to do is we should list all of the people that have interns and how many each one of them are and just in, and send them thank you because I think that that list would actually go out pretty well. I know Brevard does things. I know that we do things. There's some great opportunities. And I'm not saying there are some people that are just slammed, but there's no reason that a company that has more than 15 workers can't hire a kid. I mean, we have, a, we have programs for everybody. Um, and I, and I appreciate that man for talking to me like the way that he did. Um, next thing is, is if we can get the form to the parents, what I found is, is that these kids don't bring their paperwork home, right? So if we can send that form some sort of way to their parents so that they know, because you know, if we don't, you know, they, they just won't bring it to them, but they will, um, the parents will respond. And then, um, the last thing is, is that I'm, I'm like, there's literally no other school district that does what we do, Ms. Rutledge. Nobody, nobody. I promise you, nobody. Nobody has aquaculture. Nobody has a freaking aviation hangar. Nobody has anything. Like, no, they just don't. They don't. And I'm sorry, they just don't. We should be saying that we have the best career and technical programs in the state. I know you got your friends. You don't really want to you know, shame them and stuff like that. But let's do it, man. Let's just say. And until somebody comes and tells us we don't, then we do, right? I'm serious. I'm, I'm serious. I mean, think well, of the things that we Mr. do. Mr. Susan, I'd add to that. I, I, sh I shamelessly let folks know that when the feds came and asked the Florida Department of Education, hey, we're very interested in career and technical education and how you do it in Florida, the DOE, and they asked, where should we go to see the best programs? The department said, you got to go to Brevard. That speaks for itself, yeah. so to your point. No, 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 but we need to tell them, yeah, because we are the best. Like, that's what we need to do. We need to plant the flag, because the bottom line is, is that it's something to be proud of in our district. It's something to brag about. And we can draw more companies, and we can create more jobs. Just so everybody knows, Orange County's building a career and technical center right across the, five, right across the, the county line. They're going to start competing with us for our aviation job. And we've got to pick up our game to get our kids from working inside McDonald's and places like that, we got to get going. I mean, it's massive. I want to. I mean, we got to get going. We're the best. Thank you, Miss Rutledge. A lot of it's because of you. Not so much Dr. Mullins's presentations, but because of your hard work. So thank you. <laughs> I just want to say thank you very much, and Miss Rutledge, thank you so much. Cocoa Beach Junior Senior High School has been begging and asking, and this could not be a better fit for them in that school. So thank you very much for pursuing that, and I'm very excited excited about the partnership with the Brevard Zoo, too. This should be perfect. That's the only one in the state, right? Except for South Carolina? The only one on the East Coast? You can count them on one hand. The only one north of... <laughs> yeah, but they don't matter. I don't... They don't... I know they don't have Brevard Zoo as their partner. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. Best, best zoo in the country. Good zoo. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Sorry to get us off our rail. But um, so, Dr. Mullins. You're probably going to be mad at me for this. But am I correct if I said that there's rumors about, like, an aerospace program possibly? <laughs> maybe. maybe. <laughs> you, you, you are going to get me in trouble. because oh, <laughs> <laughs> I have spoken it into existence out there. Yes, we're in very, very early conversations but acknowledge that we want to expand our aerospace aviation uh, opportunities for our students. Uh, we've got a lot on our plate right now for the coming year and the year after that, but it's, it's, there have been conversations about that. So stay tuned. That'll be part of a CTE highlight in the near future, but you are right. And I might be selfishly advocating for District 3, so uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but I do, uh, as much as I uh, love you, Dr. Mullins, I just want to appreciate the people sitting behind you uh, because you guys are an amazing team, an amazing partnership. Uh, teamwork makes the dream work over there. You guys are incredible what you do. And the reason that we are able to brag about these CTE programs is because of all the work and effort that you do and the people that work alongside of you. 
and I have spoken to many people in the community that are quick to say your name and praise you equally. Uh, you, you, I don't even know who you haven't talked to, to be honest. <laughs> so well done, and I appreciate you. Thank you so much for everything you do for Brevard Public Schools. Mr. Jacobs, if I can echo that, I appreciate you acknowledging, uh, you know, uh, Grace, I, I've struggled with her last name throughout the entire <laughs> tour. I got it right at the very last tour, and she wasn't there to witness it. <laughs> But Grace, uh, all of those follow-up calls and in interest and inquiries about internships, we know you've been fielding, and uh, thank you very much. But I also want to include our resource teachers for career and technical education. We have five teachers, five, right? Resource teachers. We have over 40 different diverse programs, and those five men and women manage and coordinate and keep track of and support and respond to over 40 different programs, 82 plus different industry certifications. They are in impressive individuals in their own right and their willingness to take on such a diverse array of different programs and serve every one of them with excellence is just so impressive, so thank you. Dr. Mullins, I will just add to the conversation about our resource teachers. So my son completed the CNA program at Titusville High School this year which was phenomenal for him, he decided he's going into the medical field. It's all the things, like, all the things we hope the CTE does for our kids did for him, right? Um, however, he lost his teacher mid-program. Late program, not even mid-program. Late program lost his teacher. And our resource teacher stepped in and served that class to get them through their state board successfully. So it's not even managing all of the different aspects of the different programs and providing support. But it's also like, when it comes down to it, they're stepping in the classroom and making sure our kids are successful. So um, absolutely, kudos to them. Kudos, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've said to Rachel, hey, can you reach out to this person? Because they asked me about this, that, or the other thing. She is on it. If she has not already talked to them, which 90% of the time she already has. Um, but if she hasn't, she's on it right away and building those relationships and and making things happen for all of our kids throughout Brevard. So, yes, and, and Grace, I can't even imagine what you're dealing with all, with all the internship programs and moving parts and making that all work, because I know that we have gotten uh, very flexible with when we can accommodate internship <laughs> opportunities with our kids, and so it's just, it's a huge machine with so many moving parts and a very small team to make it work. So thank you for all the work you did. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Dr. Mullins. All right. Just going to do a, a uh, check-in. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, so just want to do a, a check-in with the board. We are right at 7 o'clock. We're getting ready to go into public comment. We have four speakers for agenda-related public comment. Do you guys want to take a quick restroom break before we get into it, or...? That's fine. So I have a request for a quick recess. We'll take about a 10 minute recess and then reconvene.
All right, we are back in session and now at the public comments portion of the meeting on agenda items. We have four speakers this evening for agenda items. Therefore, each speaker will receive three minutes. Please note that the time is per speaker, not per agenda item. Topics not specific to agenda items will be moved to the non-agenda portion of the meeting. We have a clock in front of me to help you keep track of your time. When your time is over, you'll be asked to stop and allow the next speaker his or her turn. Always keep in mind that reasonable decorum is expected and your statement should be directed to the board chair. The chair may interrupt, warn, or terminate a participant's statement when time is up, personally directed, abusive, obscene, or irrelevant. Should an individual not observe proper etiquette, the chair may request the individual to leave the meeting. I'm just gonna go ahead and call up all four speakers. Um, since there's only four of them, if you guys would line up at the east wall. So we have Katie Delaney, Michelle Beavers, Sarah Mursky, and then Jabari Hosey. Members of the board, as the public has shared over and over again, public trust has been shattered. When policy 169.1, public participation, came up for revision again, I had hoped that the board would take this opportunity to help begin to restore the public's trust by stopping the infringement on our right. Part of your job is to, live, is to listen to our grievances, all of them. The Founding Fathers would be ashamed at the actions of this board and your continued restrictions of our freedom of speech. This policy should have been revised to allow all participants three minutes to speak. Many of you have stated that this is not the place to have a meaningful conversation, and I disagree. Over the past few months, I have been involved with the Brevard Charter Review Committee meetings. At these meetings, the public is, meant, is met with digni dignity and respect, even when there are disagreements. We get three minutes per agenda item, and there are two opportunities in the middle and the end for general comment. This is the way our gover government meetings should go. You are not our rulers, you are our representatives. You are here to act on the people's will, not the other way around. And it should all be in the sunshine, not behind closed doors or through email. I would also like a list of words that are that, uh, from the board that are not allowed to be used at meetings. Last meeting, you silenced a member of the public for using the correct biological scientific word for a body part. Since you are now the word police, I'm asking for a list of words that are banned. As we are talking about this, as we are talking about this board banning certain words, I would like to point out the hypocrisy of this because you have no problem with descriptive pedophilic acts, extreme detailed rape of children, and other ex explicit horrible sexual acts being in books in the libraries. One board member went as far as suggesting that parents should read these disgusting books with our children. I don't know about you all, but I'm not going to read violent pedophilic pornography with my children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delaney. Michelle Beavers? I'm here to talk about the books. Um, Currently, right now, we have 41 books we've um, given you for review or challenging. Uh, right now, your proposal says that we have, you have one week for 100 pages to review the books. You have three weeks to set a date after that about reading the books, um, have, have a meeting after it. And then you have five days, which is another week, to report to the superintendent and five days to notify the board. That is six weeks for most 300-page uh, books, six to eight weeks for most of the books we've, we've submitted. Um, according to what you put on there, it's going to be one committee who does this, which means that if it takes six weeks for, per book, it's going to take 246 weeks to do the 41 books we've given you, which is 4.73 years just to get to the 41. Um, that might be a little bit um, too much. Uh, and also, they, the, on your um, the review committee is two school media specialist representatives at grade level a principal or assistant principal, a content specialist, and a parent um, representing each board member. 
which sounds okay, except some of those people are paid by the school district, so if you don't want them to vote a certain way, it might be a little bit fresher for them not to. I think this committee should be made up of all parents, um, volunteer parents who can come in. Um, you, have, you have said on the, uh, that it will be one committee for the entire school year. I don't think it's quite fair to have one committee for the entire school year. Um, and it says you'll have eight years after removal of a book. What happens in eight years? Does the book automatically go back on the shelf? Is it kept off? Is it reviewed again? Eight years is, is, doesn't tell you what happens in eight years. Um, and let's see. Um, there is no book list right now. So if it says if, if, if a book is in one school, only one school, it goes back to the school level, which means that school reviews it instead of the school district board that you're going to put together for review. If it gets removed from that one school, does that mean it goes on a list and all schools don't get it then? Because it sounds like you're putting it just back on one school, which means the other librarians can then order that book. So I don't see a way that you're actually putting a list together of books that shouldn't be in our libraries. Um, we have a, a website called booklook.info, which we've got all these book reports on, except for the last 17 that I've sent you that, that are going up soon. Um, the, I'm going to read a small excerpt. If you have kids, you might want to cover their ears. His tongue is by if, mouth. Hold on one time. second, please. So if it's not appropriate for children to hear it, then I need you not to say it at the microphone, okay? It's, it's, the, it's the most um, watered-down version of anything in this book. There's no explicit, explicit words, just so. But I want people to understand what we're talking about because people don't understand how horrible these books are. So if you have to ask parents to cover the ears of their children, then I need you not to say it at the microphone, okay? Well, because I, it's, it's suggestive. It's not explicit. It's suggestive. So I wouldn't want my five-year-old to hear it. Um, and we probably shouldn't say it at the microphone, ma'am. Okay. Well, th this book it talks about... Please. Nope. The, 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 this is a booklook.info. You can go look up all these books. However, the, it, any, any kind of penetration, which is what um, the finger does in this, in this excerpt, um, is considered a PG-17 rating. PG-17 is above an R. If we have to sign permission slips for a PG movie, um, in, a, in a school, we shouldn't have to have PG-17, which is above an R rating in our schools. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, Ms. Mursky. Super quick housekeeping question before I might, you start my timer. You have agenda items for a public hearing. Would we, are we going to get three minutes on each of those as well? You mean not, Ms. A, not agenda? There's public hearings on the agenda for, yeah, it's on the agenda, G28, G29, and G30. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair and Board. My name is Sarah Mursky, and I'm going to talk about uh, F25, the middle school uh, construction management service sales or tax renewal. Um, I'm asking the board to vote no on this tonight um, because I had sat through the audit audit committee meeting um, and I had came away with more questions than answers. Um, the materials in the RSM uh, the, for the presentation, the math was off, um, and I just have a lot more questions than answers on this particular agenda item. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marsky. Mr. Hosey? Uh, this is extremely frustrating having to come before the school board and superintendent asking that you follow policy. Uh, if there is a new policy put in place uh, for books, the new book policy is flawed in the informal process, review process leaves one individual and the principal or media specialist under pressure by a parent group that has terrorized our schools for the last year. There's already a statute that guides our books and policies, it, um, so it isn't necessary to supersede it. The current handling of the books being removed and not a removal of Epic and Prodigy also tells me that you're listening to the bullies and not the majority. This must stop for the sake of our public schools. Please stop folding to this loud, angry, small group. Moms for Liberty and their one-off one -off, uh, Tea Party Mr. group Hosey, doesn't dictate Mr. our Mr. Hosey, hold one second, please, for me. So I'm going to ask you to stop attacking another group, okay? If you can just get your point across without that, that would be awesome. Thanks. Okay. Uh, where are the limits? How, are we, uh, how far are we willing to go to appease them? Many of them are attacking our public schools with little vested interest. Um, as they send their school kids to private and charter schools, and I wonder if they're sending them the same list. 
Help protect our schools and allow our students to use the best tools and books to grow as well-rounded humans that live in this reality. The world is diverse. The workplace is diverse. We need children that are not sheltered and filled with hate so they don't become the next said group. Or one of their original blueprints, the Daughters of Confederacy or the Ku Klux Klan, terrorizing our schools because they don't want diversity, equity, Mr. or Hosey. inclusion. I Audi repeat, Mr. please Hosey. stop caving to the organization. Mr. Hosey, I'm going to ask you to rein it in, okay? You can't, I, I, audience members, you guys, I'm addressing the issue, but I need you all not to interrupt. So the way that the rules work is, I address it, I ask for it to be corrected. If he's willing to correct it, then we move on with the time. Mr. Hosey, am I correct in understanding yes. that you're going to stop with the attacks or name calling? Thank you, sir. Okay. So what precedent are we setting with, the book, with our books, our tools, that has something uh, with diversity like LGBTQ, uh, that there's a complaint that these books get tossed out, or black people in history and a parent can complain that it's CRT and labeled and tossed out. If the state feels that there's tools or materials or books that violate these discriminatory bills, then they should call it out and explain why. Uh, it amazes me that we don't indoctrinate our children with things like critical race theory or lead our, our classes um, in discussions of sexual orientation and gender identity in elementary schools, uh, that somehow our schools, our school libraries are full of porn, uh, this narrative is, is what it is, it's a lie. Uh, please communicate the truth that BPS holds educating all students with excellence, whether that's a student with privilege, poor, black, brown, white, gay, straight. We celebrate them no matter who they are, we keep them safe, and we understand how far we've come. Please make sure that these narratives stay what they are, rhetoric and lies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hosey. Audience members, please hold your applause. Okay, that concludes public comments on agenda items. We thank you for your willingness to address us in this public manner. That will now move us into the consent agenda. Dr. Mullins? There are 17 agenda items under this category. Does any board member wish to pull any item from the consent <coughs> agenda? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. I move. Second. Moved by Ms. McDougall, seconded by Ms. Campbell. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. Motion passes 5-0. <clears throat> yeah, I'm good. I just hear me. All right. But we, we are now at the public hearing portion of the agenda. First is to hold a hearing and approve item G28. Is there anyone present to address the board regarding board policy 5630.01, seclusion and restraint of students with disabilities? Delaney? I have more so a comment rather than um, a question about about this policy. Um, I just find the timing of it very interesting, especially when this instance happened to a seven-year-old child in Brevard Public Schools earlier this year when a mask was forcibly tied on her face. Um, it, it's just very interesting that this is now being brought to the table. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delaney. Is there anyone else that wishes to address policy 5630.01, seclusion and restraint of students? Mirsky? Good evening, Madam Chair and Board. And I just want to echo with uh, what Ms. Delaney had mentioned, and I know I'm supposed to address the board. Um, I find this policy also, the timing of this policy, incredibly interesting since the school board by majority of vote, chose to force face mask our children without parental consent, and many of them being special needs students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marski. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the board on policy 5630.01, seclusion and restraint of students with disabilities? Is there anyone present who wishes to address the board on policy 5630.01, seclusion and restraint of students? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Move. Moved by Ms. McDougall. Seconded by Ms. Campbell. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. Motion passes 5-0. Next is to hold a, hold a hearing and approve item G29. Is there anyone present to address the board regarding board policy 2521 instructional materials program? Either Marcy or Ms. Harris, whoever. Good.
Good evening, Madam Chair and Board. Um, Sarah, I'm Sarah Mursky. I've got two children in Brevard Public Schools. I'm a voter constituent. Um, I want just want to point out that um, these the the materials of concern um, isn't doesn't have any educational value. And I want to point out that just as school computers have filters and firewalls, we need to protect our children from certain things. There's a reason why our school computers and things have have filters and firewalls because we don't want children accessing things that are illegal to them, for them, or um, harmful to them. Um, in one of the books, it tells children how to meet sexual partners online. That is certainly not something I want my children having knowledge of. And no, I do not give free reign to my children on their electronic uh, devices, contrary to popular belief. Um, the other point I want to bring up is that in one of the books, it talks about uh, the explicit account of a pedophile raping a child over and over again. And the only reason that that would serve for me to have my children read that or to read that with my child would be incredibly harmful. And everybody that's in a classroom setting, it's a court mandate. And this is clearly against the law. This is not about book banning. This is not about not teaching history or supposed to be some sort of um, bias against anybody or any group. This is simply about protecting children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mursky. Audience, please hold your applause. <laughs> Ms. Beavers. As I mentioned before, the 41 books would take between four and a half to seven, six years to review at the current um, standards you have on here. And that's assuming that most of them are 300 to 350 pages. Um, I, I'm asking you to please take the books off the shelves now and then review them. That makes the most sense. Um, they should not be lumped in with the school curriculum books. You have lumped, in, lumped them in together. And I understand the reason for wanting to keep the curriculum books available um, while you're reviewing, but this isn't curriculum. This is sexually explicit material that's designed to excite you. And that should not be in our schools. And it shouldn't be checked out by a child who has no idea what they're checking out until they come across these passages. And I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, I don't think there's any question here about how bad these are. Um, if you take them off the shelves first, it's not going to hurt anybody. Um, you're, you're actually going to be buying tons of these books at, with your current policy and giving them out to everybody to read. It's going to be expensive. Um, it's going to be uh, just not very cost effective. Um, uh, there was another, another point I had to make with you guys. Um, uh, Oh, it, it never tells you in eight years what happens to these books. Are they, do they get put back on? Do they not get put back on? And also, um, the, the, I would like to stop this from happening over. I'd like the librarians to post a list of books they plan to buy. I don't think that's, that's too much. I think that's, that's putting out there in the sunshine. If you plan to buy this book, it should be out there for the, for the public to review before it gets in our library so this doesn't happen again. We don't have to keep chasing these books after they get in the library. Um, it doesn't take much effort to put those that list out there and let the public review it. Um, these books are available for you to view, like I said, on that website, so everyone can see what's going on. This has nothing to do with CRT. It has nothing to do with, with race or anything like that. This has to do with sexually explicit material, period. Um, we also are trying to look at the drug aspect, too. Um, the drugs aspect of, of enticing kids to take drugs, telling them how cool it is in some of these books. And then what happens after they take the drugs is, of course, sexually explicit things. Um, that shouldn't be a, a thing that you find in our library. Our library is supposed to be a safe place for these kids. When you see it in our library, the kids think that's normal. That's what's part of life is. And that's not the normal that I want for my children or anybody else's children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beavers. Is there anyone else that wishes to address Board Policy 2521 Instructional Materials? Good evening. My name is Tawan Owens. I am a constituent of Brevard County. I recently just had a son graduate last year from private school. However, I am a, um, a successful story of the public schools throughout Florida. I uh, born and raised in Palm Beach and literally <clears throat> as a health educator, 
um, for years, for over 20 years, I did HIV and as a social worker. <clears throat> it's ironic how parents want the schools to take certain things out when their kids are actually doing it regardless. In schools, there is only a certain limit that you can go to, right? We have dealt with individuals, kids, that have sex, that parents are saying that they're not having sex because parents don't know. Um, anal sex, oral sex is sex. And so kids are doing this. This is the reality. As a social worker, this is the reality. Hold on just one second, ma'am. So I'm going to remind our audience that you all are here as observers, not interrupting other public commenters, OK? I, you heard me address the two words that she used. The other words are nothing different than anyone else used when you all were up there. I'm, I'm just some, some people. I'm not looking at you, Sarah. I'm looking in that general direction. But I need for the interruption of the public commenter to stop, OK? It's their time when they're at the microphone. Let's be respectful. Everyone will get their chance. And I will address it as it comes up, OK? Go ahead. As a parent, I have three kids, one who serves in the United States Army, one who serves our congressional leaders um, for Washington, and one, like I said, just graduated and is in college. It's very sad as a uh, community leader, um, a business owner, to watch individuals take what has been the authority of the school. Books are what they are. There used to be a time where you could sign and have your kid not participate during a certain assignment. Why are we now at a point where it's, I won't say the requirement, but it's the law of a group of individuals and we take that to govern the entire um, school community. As a LGBT woman, it is not, and it has never been, um, my place to teach children, and I am involved with children daily, about sexuality. I do not. Unfortunately, parents, children have their own questions. They see it, commercials. You can turn on your television, and there are commercials that show Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate you joining us. All right. Is there anyone else present who wishes to address board policy 2521? Sir? My name's Robert Taylor. And uh, my on one second, Mr. Taylor. I just want to make sure I have your mic actually on. OK. Go ahead. My name's Robert Taylor. Uh, I'm here not to express anything about myself. It's my grandkids, great grandkids, that I'm concerned with. Uh, seems like we have a problem. I was here uh, a few years ago, and this LGBT whatever gay rights thing was an issue then, and it hasn't gone away yet. Uh, is there anybody here? That took sir, biology, I'm going to interrupt you for biology. sir. I'm going to interrupt you for just a second, okay? For just a couple of things, I just want to make sure we're all staying on the same path, okay? Um, and I've stopped the timer, so I'm not I'm not taking any of, any of your time away. So the policy that we're talking about has to do specifically with instructional materials, and because we're on the public hearing for instructional the instructional materials policy, I need you to keep your comments focused on that policy, if you would. Um, and then the other thing that I would ask is if you could please address the board as opposed to addressing the audience. Okay. Thank you so much. Go ahead when you're ready. Uh, so the problem uh, isn't about teaching. We have biology classes for biology and uh, sociology classes. Maybe they have them in college, I know, and a lot of colleges 
in the high school now. But the problem is biology versus psychology. And my daughter studies psychology, and uh, she brought up the term delusional one time. I didn't even know what it meant at the time, but it means can't accept facts. Their feelings are more real than fact. They need to see a psychologist to deal with that. Now, introducing all this stuff to stir the pot at a young age, I don't believe is appropriate for my great grandchildren. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Is there anyone else present that wishes to address the board regarding policy 2521 instructional materials? Good evening, Madam Chair and Board. I wasn't going to speak on this topic, but I feel like at this point I must, as a parent, step up and also voice my concern about you removing the 41 books of concern that Michelle has spoken about this evening due to sexually explicit content for children that are minors in your care. As you are the Board of Education, as a parent, I implore you to seriously consider removing these 41 books first and then have them reviewed because what I foresee for you as a board is that this is not only inappropriate, morally reprehensible, and illegal to allow children inappropriate content, but also it will present serious liabilities for the board in the future. Legal ramifications if this sexually explicit content is not immediately removed. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the board on policy 2521 instructional material? Elaine? <clears throat> My children don't currently go to Brevard Public Schools because I cannot trust that the people sitting up on that dais are going to protect them. My child, my oldest child, is one year away from not having another option. That is why I'm here every two weeks. In one of these books, that's currently in many of the junior and senior high schools, it speaks about a man sexually abusing, in detail, little children and talking about how he's feeding them ice cream while he does it and laughs at them giggling. That's what you want our 11-year-old children having access to? I am sorry that I am getting very aggravated, but I am done. I am done with you people abusing our children. We have dealt with it for years now, and I am done. It is against the law, it's against Florida state statute to distribute pornography and sexually explicit material to our children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delaney. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the board on policy 2521, instructional materials? Is there anyone else present who wishes to address the board regarding policy 2521, instructional materials? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Moved by Ms. McDougall, seconded by Ms. Campbell. Is there any discussion? Ms. Campbell? <clears throat> so, I have this discussion about policy. I can take just a minute. Um, there was some question as to why we're revising the policy. It had to do with restraint, and um, people can go back to the workshop where we addressed that work session, and that is 
doesn't have anything to do with the subject that was brought up. It has to do with actually a change in state law, and we have to um, adjust our policies just like we always do. When state laws change, we adjust our policies. So, but on to this one. Um, Dr. Sullivan and Ms. Klein, I may need to call on you. I've got a couple of questions. Um, one, uh, I know that we've already, in following the informal process, we have already removed, um, schools have already removed some of the books um, that have been brought to question in an informal process. A head nod is good. If we're correct. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Dr. Sullivan and Ms. Klein, would you please come and provide some additional clarification? Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Klein, while you're coming, the other question was, you know, we had a conversation at our work session about what we would do with books that um, were challenged, whether they, um, if they failed the challenge, that we were going to have some kind of mechanism of, um, you know, putting that in the database so that media specialists would be aware of the challenges at the school or district level. So just, you know, if you could kind of just bring some clarification to that. want to clarify the question I'm answering about the books specifically in the libraries currently. Right. Okay, I just want to make, so yeah, let, yeah well, so I can, I'd be happy to address what we've done in that case. I've certainly shared it with the board and the requester. Um, at this point, that information is in what I would consider the informal process um, aligned with both the previous process and the recommended change in process. In the previous process before amendment, then a requester would have to file a petition at each school. And, but the first step in that process was an informal meeting with the principal. Given the requesters had a large list with a few different schools, first thing we did was send it out to the schools to uh, one, verify the information and for their media specialists to review. Um, as you guys are aware, there is new state law that does put that responsibility on the media specialists. So um, in some cases, the data set that we had had some inaccuracies. So big surprise, sometimes books are lost, right? So in some cases, media specialists went to pull it, a book was lost. In some cases, the media specialist reviewed the book and felt that it was not appropriate for their collection any longer. In our current uh, practice, media specialists weed their collection every single year and will pull materials based on um, checkout data, age appropriateness, and other factors. So there were several titles that upon review from the media specialists, they chose to remove those from their circulation based on all those criteria, age appropriateness, circulation data. Um, in some cases, there was updated reviews available online for them to review and make some decisions. Um, so there's a, that's why it wasn't really a head nod, because there's a few different scenarios. So our media specialists have been uh, maintaining that data along with our district uh, content specialists to make sure we had accurate information and in good faith uh, presented it to them um, on behalf of the requester so that they would not have to go through everyone, every school site. It's much easier for me to communicate with schools. Um, they've maintained a current list um, and we've shared that a few times in the making. So um, as they continue to review them, I'm getting some updated information. Um, you know, sometimes we have media specialists in our schools right now that weren't the ones that purchased the book. And so we certainly appreciate uh, requests to review those titles, and the media specialists have, re, you know, appreciated the opportunity to review any of those. Um, our juniors and seniors all um, have some slightly different process, but we've actually had an opportunity through these discussions to tighten that up a little bit, um, and primarily really clear designation on high school only or middle school only books, and in some cases for that media specialist, they didn't feel comfortable in. Uh, monitoring that, so in that case, they might have also pulled the book. So uh, the libraries are set up different, physically staffed, um, and different levels of ability, so the media specialists have made those decisions. 
So uh, I would say a significant number of books. I don't have like, you know, I like data. <laughs> um, and I absolutely would have given you an exact number. Um, but a significant percentage of books have been removed from circulation um, based on the media specialist review of information presented by the requester. Um, any other parent concern, I always, you all know, I work with a lot of parent concerns, request as much information as possible, present that information to the schools, work alongside the schools in process and policy to help them consider that concern being brought by the parent. Um, so uh, we did just receive an additional list um, yesterday, if I'm saying that correctly, and that list uh, is kind of in the hopper like the others. Um, Ms. Slack, once again, is giving me the information on where they are, in what libraries, where they exist, and in the case of this most recent list, a couple of titles um, may be in um, high school AP classes, and so we're gathering that information as well. And so my first step is to have exact factual information on where any of these titles may be, and then that same list will go back out to the schools as well principals and media specialists for them to review it against what their criteria is, what is appropriate, and they've been extremely thoughtful. Um, I think all parties would agree that the media specialists have been responsive to the information received, um, have viewed them carefully, and then made some decisions along the way um, based on that. Um, so like any other presented concern, we appreciate concerns being brought our way and have been uh, pretty careful to review them thoroughly at the schools and make some of those decisions. Um, and so that's where it stands. It's all at an informal stage at this point. I know that um, I can't speak for anyone else. They, they, I, we imagine there'll be a point of formal, um, whether it is school-based or district-based. Obviously, we didn't have a district-based formal process until this policy making is complete, um, but at that time we'll follow that policy as well. So, you know, in short, up till now we have followed the spirit of the existing policy, which is an opportunity of informal review, and um, the schools have been, in my opinion, really responsive to our request for them to take a look, and um, we have, uh, you know, that's that's where it sits right now. I hope that answered your question. It did. Thank okay. you. Yep, Thank sure. you for that detail at level of detail and thank you for the work you guys have done and, and for being responsive to the people from the public I very much appreciate that second question I think that was from Ms. Klein okay. as far as we talked about a mechanism it doesn't necessarily belong a policy so much as procedure but can you kind of just clarify <coughs> as to what happens then at, at each level if a, if a book fails to meet a challenge whether either at the school level or at the district level either in the a process or the B process um, you know, what are, what are we going to do to inform our media specialists that that happened in the past? So as Dr. Sullivan just said, our media, library media K-12 person is very much involved with every media specialist in our district with ongoing training every year. She is going to conduct, she does conduct annual training on how to weed through a library book and um, remove titles that are of question. So once this policy is completed, we were going to start then on a, um, the administrative procedures, making certain that this process is complete. But part of that administrative procedure is any book who is removed, which is removed, is completely communicated with everyone on the, in the school system. And then, as you know, July 1, we have amendments to this policy that will come forth again with changes in instructional material and responsibilities of the media specialist in vetting books. And we're waiting for a clarification right now from the DOE. Okay. Sure. I think one of the things Ms. Klein, if I'm not mistaken, and I added um, was that those would be posted on our media website. And yeah, that was our, uh, so um, we currently maintain a you know resource page for our medias Assistance, as in we do every other page. So any book that has been through a challenge process um, would be posted on there with the outcome. And that mimics the upcoming state process. 
So in the new bill, the state outlines um, that they will be maintaining a state website where we would submit all that information to the state. That'll be a public site. So again, in the spirit of the law, we felt it was appropriate to mimic that at the district level. And so to answer that question, the books will be on a public website. The media specialists, of course, will certainly um, see that as well, but our public can as well for parents, you know, who want to, you know, be involved in that level. I imagine something like that at the state level will be helpful to our media specialists too, so that if something, it just would be a, a flag. I don't, and I, it's my understanding of the list. It's not doesn't necessarily mean this is the banned book list. Don't buy anything off this, but it's just for awareness. Hey, if you if you're going to take a look at these, you better you better know what you're talking about. You better have reason to justify it. you're adding it to the collection. One thing I wanted to add, Ms. Campbell, as well is we know that the law comes effective in July 1. However, the training for our media specialists, um, early awareness from the DOE is that training will not start until the following January. January. Mm -hmm. So we know that there's going to be some lag time with uh, clarification from the DOE on how that process will work. Well, I just have to say I appreciate that on this and as well as other measures that you guys don't wait, but you go ahead and, and start doing what needs to be done in anticipation of the changes that are coming. Um, thank you. I just, thank you. I don't have any more questions. I, I'll just add board, you know, as, as you guys have heard the same, you get in the same emails that I, I'm getting for the most part, um, they're sent to us as a group and we've heard lots of public comment about um, one group of parents versus another group of parents. I think I've shared with the board before, but I'll just reiterate it, that when it comes down to it, no, it's not any group of parents' responsibility to decide what another group of parents' children can read. If you look at statute, the state gives us as a board, we are personally responsible as a board, collectively responsible as a board, to make sure that the materials that are in our schools abide by the law. And so that's why we have this policy, and that's why you know the people who are uh, doing this job ultimately it, it falls on us. And so um, it's our decision to make this policy. And we've you know there were some things that some of us didn't want in there that <clears throat> got in there. Some things of uh, things that some of us wanted in there that didn't get in there. And so uh, we work through it together as a board. And so I think that for what it is, um, uh, it's going to be very helpful. And just would point out again that we've talked about it before, but the policy as we had in place that we put in place in 2019, the last time we revised it, actually we'd never, <laughs> we'd never used the challenge process, um, but we found through this process that it was going, not going to meet the needs of the current challenges, and I, which I, I'm going to just pretty much think I can safely assume that uh, we will be using it in the future and uh, probably won't slow down too much for a while, but um, I think it's, uh, overall a good policy and some may, we've made some good changes that'll help us adapt to um, the needs of the time. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Does any other board member have any discussion? I will, um, <clears throat> Dr. Moltens, did you want to say something? If I may, I want to just uh, first acknowledge and commend both Mrs. Klein and Dr. Sullivan in their extraordinarily attentive care as well as response to uh, this issue when it first came forward. I have been in ongoing conversation with both about uh, honoring our existing board policy prior to the, you know, the anticipated adoption of the new policy and the acknowledgement that it does not respond well to the current situation of multiple books from a, a, a group or individual to be considered across the entire district. But in very careful consideration of our existing policy and honoring, as Dr. Sullivan uh, very appropriately explained, the spirit or the merit of the policy uh, supported and approved them, them to move forward in making that list of books available to our media specialists as ultimately they could be asked, questioned, potentially confronted with the books and any one of them that could be in their schools because all of that information is available online. So um, that is what prompted us moving forward as although it didn't completely align with our board policy, uh, I made the final ultimate application. I believe that that was the right thing to do and, and we moved forward and, and that's the process that's been in place and I believe it aligns with what the new policy will do more directly and so on. 
So I did want to publicly acknowledge and uh, express my appreciation to my leadership team for their great work on this effort and bringing forward a, a virtually a policy that the board has made very little amendment to from the work that they presented to the board. And then finally, um, an acknowledgement of the unfortunate, I would suggest, and difficult position this new legislation puts our media specialists in, given the fact that training and direction from the state is, is going to be delayed until January. Um, I wanted to let the board know I've already been in conversation with FADS, the Association of District School Superintendents. We have already, as an organization, presented this situation to the Department of Education. Haven't received a response that provides any additional confidence that we're not still in a difficult situation yet, I will, I will say. But um, we are addressing it as state district leaders to the department in, um, in hopes that they will expedite that training because we are held accountable to the new statute January, or excuse me, July 1. So just wanted the board to be aware that we are continuing to pursue that even as a collective superintendents across the state. Thank you, Dr. Mullins. Um, anyone else? I'm sorry. Um, I just I have a quick comment and then I'll go ahead and call the question. It was met, mentioned several times how long it's going to take us to get through all of the books that have been presented. And that's part of the reason why we're transitioning to the new policy. And the new policy does in fact have in there that the superintendent can convene additional committees should he find it necessary to do so. Um, and so I think that's an important uh, important recognition that it's quite possible that we may have to look at that option um, based on you know the number of books that we're providing. So that flexibility is in there should it, it need to be um, taken advantage of. Um, and then, you know, just a quick, I've heard from a lot of people that they have concerns that we are um, taking away voice by moving to a district committee. And I think that, um, first of all, it's, it is unreasonable to expect that any school would convene multiple committees, and we, we talked about this in the beginning of this process, to address each of the books that they have in their collection at their school. And so, it just is not feasible um, and takes way too much time away from the work that those individuals that would be per participating in the committee work would ha should be doing. Um, and so this is a not, I have not heard any board member say that they want to take away voice from the community or remove the opportunity to consider some books may be appropriate at some levels and not at others or in certain communities and not at other communities. That is not the goal. Um, but I think we have very clear statutory language as to the expectations. Um, and we have to be able to fulfill that role. And we need to do it in the most effective and efficient way possible for our already overtaxed. So just want to make sure that that clarification was there as well. And with that, if there's no one else, then I will call the question. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The motion passes 5-0. All right, next is to hold hearing and approve item G30. Is there anyone present to address the board regarding board policy 0169.1, participation at board meetings? Ms. Mursky? Good evening again, Madam Chair and Board. Um, my name is Sarah Mursky. As you know, I'm a voter, constituent, and taxpayer of Brevard County. I've got two children in Brevard Public Schools. Um, I just want to make it clear that when I come before the board and talk, I'm talking on behalf of myself and the concerns that I have as a parent. I'm not speaking on behalf of any organization, but if other organizations and parents agree with me, so be it. Um, but I'm going to talk about public input policy. Um, what I'm hearing from, what I've heard from a couple of school board members is that the state only gives you one minute, so we should be happy if we get three minutes or one minute. And my response to that, to the school board as a whole, is that when you're bringing something to the state, that's more of an investigation or more of a, uh, almost like a court case. Here, this is about our community. This is about our children. This is about building relationships with each other and working with each other. 
And so I feel parents need to come and have a voice. And I understand the policy of wanting to mirror, of get, giving non-gender items more time, but I believe parents deserve more respect and more dignity than that, and also people such as our bus drivers and people who come to address the board. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to address the board regarding board policy 0169.1, Ms. Delaney? The revision of this policy um, gave you guys a real opportunity to do the right thing. The public has lost all trust, and part of that is because the communication has been cut off. We have been through unprecedented times together, and um, my time hasn't started. Thank you. Um, Sorry. Uh, we've been through unprecedented times together, and I think that we've moved through a lot of it with the COVID mitigations and all that. Um, but now, because parents are really digging in and paying attention to what's going on in the schools, we are seeing what's going on in the schools, and we are not happy. We are not happy at all, and we have the right and the obligation to show up here every two weeks at every school board meeting, which I have done, to let you know that we are not happy with what's going on. There are kids having sex in bathrooms daily. There are multiple Instagram pages that are, are out for fights that are going on in the schools. Southwest Middle School alone has five that we've found where we saw a teacher get laid out by two students. We need the opportunity to come to you people and the public because this is the only opportunity we have. Three minutes is not enough. We should be able to fully express our grievances and have a conversation back and forth with our representatives. You are not our rulers. These are our schools. It's our tax dollars. You represent us. We have the right to share our grievances with you. And I have come to every workshop, and not one thing that any member of the public has mentioned in these workshops has made your policy changes vary. Not one thing. That is not working for the public, Ms. Belford. And I'm directing it at you because I can't direct it to the rest of you. and especially somebody that's up for re-election, should be hearing me loudly when I say you are my representative, and you are my representative. We should be heard, and we should not be silent. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delaney. Is there anyone else that wishes to address policy 0169.1, board partic participation at board meeting? All right. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. I'd, I'd like to speak. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I need a motion and a second to open for yeah, discussion. Yeah. Okay. So I have a motion from Ms. McDougall and a second from Ms. Campbell. On that would open for discussion. <laughs> Did, since you all motion, do either one of you want to address before I open it to Mr. Susan? Okay. Susan, the floor is yours, sir. Yeah, I just, um, just wanted to... Just wanted to take a second and say that we're back here again. Um, we've had a couple of speakers since the last time we spoke. Miss Ramsey was one of them, a uh, student who came in to talk to us about, um, you know what I mean, the program that she wanted to deliver and talking about Boys State and all the programs and literally her speech was cut within a minute and she couldn't even finish and that's one of our students. Um, I dislike the fact that we're trying to cut down on the amount of minutes I feel that there has not been a good reason given. Um, the two reasons that we kept getting back to was staff time and abuse. Um, the abuse piece, I, I argue against because from one to three minutes, the person still has 60 seconds to say something to go to three minutes, 
is not abuse. Um, in staff's time, I promise you, if you asked the back staff if any of them minded waiting because people wanted to speak for an extra two minutes, they would not have a problem with that. I, I personally think that if an individual that drives here, all the way up here, tries to get childcare, tries to get everything, regardless of if it's from the right, from the left, against my views or for my views, should be given the right to sit and speak for three minutes. I think that when you carve out certain minutes for this group, for these different times, the more I look at it, the more I'm against it. I feel that this is a bad policy. I feel it just keeps getting us into situations where we're trying to stop people in the middle of their speeches. We, we are curbing individuals. I mean, honestly, somebody comes here, the half the public doesn't even know if we are or are not, if we have the three minutes. They think they, they prepare their speech, they sit at home, they look on this piece of paper, they prepare it for three minutes because that's the normal time, and then they go drive in words of no less than 15 minutes, no more than 45 minutes to an hour to get here. They sit in the crowd, and then literally under this current policy, depending on how many speakers show up, they then have to re-scribble their speech based on one minute, two minutes, three minutes, and it's just, it. what are we doing here? We still have not been given a good reason to move to this policy, I feel, and I feel that we have examples like Ms. Ramsey, who we have cut off, and I feel that we need to, as a board, honor our individuals who are out there that want to come to speak to us. Regardless of if we like it or not, we need to hear them, and that's my speech. Mr. Campbell? Thank you. Um, so I, um, to Mr. Susan's point, um, the policy that we're voting on tonight, which is the revision, actually would have given all the people that you just mentioned three minutes. Because since we put the policy in place, it went down to one minute for non-agenda speakers. We've actually only been over, I don't have my notes in front of me. We've actually only had more than 10 people for non-agenda or agenda, I think one time, maybe twice. Um, in fact, when the policy, if we vote in just a few minutes and it passes, then everybody tonight, because now the policy will be in place, correct, Mr. Gibbs? Everybody who speaks at our non-agenda time at the end of the meeting is going to get three minutes, I believe, because I don't think we, I saw more than a handful. So everybody tonight's gonna get three minutes, not one. And the only time that it would be less than three minutes is if we have a long, you know, think about the mask meeting that we had, it was an emergency meeting, so we could have, uh, we shortened it up to one minute. We had 120, 132 people sign up. I think we had 120 actually speak that, that uh, day. Um, so it went down to one minute. And I know, Mr. Susan, you were actually trying to get people just to say, you know, I agree or I disagree, you know, um, and uh, just to save some time. Um, so we're moving to longer. It was my proposal. We're moving to longer. It, again, it's a compromise for all of us, um, but we're moving to more time. And I would just point out that actually, because we've separated agenda and non-agenda right now, people are getting more time because we have people who are signing up for agenda things and getting three minutes, and we've been, they've been getting an extra minute on other things. And there are people tonight who have already gotten the opportunity, they may have not taken the whole thing, to speak for three, six, nine, 12 minutes. And if they sign up for the last time, they're gonna get 15 before the night's over. So actually, by having agenda and non-agenda, we're actually giving people more opportunity, especially when we go to the three minutes. So um, I hear you, and that's why, and, I, and we were getting a lot of feedback from all different kinds of people um, on all sides of the political spectrum, on, from employees, students. I totally hear you, which is why I brought this forward, and I think this is going to be a good change for us um, to go from one minute to basically three minutes, unless we have a whole lot of people. Um, so, you know, think, and, and again, because we've split it agenda, non-agenda, um, we're actually giving people, people more time than they've had before. Ms. Belford, since I was named, can I respond to it? Um, let me see if there's any other board member that wants to speak, and then I'll come back okay. for follow-up, okay? Yeah, Ms. Jenkins, please. Um, I just want to make it clear to, uh, the members of the audience that are snickering at me as this is happening, uh, that I am the person who voted against this change from the get-go. Um, and I, I think it's interesting that we keep justifying all of these decisions that are being made with things like, oh, it's both sides of the political spectrum. It has nothing to do with anything about that. Like, let's just be honest. There was members of this board that wanted to change it. We had a workshop on it. We presented a policy. People voted for it. Then they wanted to amend it. 
Then we had a workshop. Then we put it on the agenda, and people voted for it. Um, I, I just, it's just crazy to me that we're like continuously defending or fighting it. Um, and I'm going to say it again. I said it last time this came up. We literally have someone on the board who takes polls on when the board meeting's going to end. So stop the games. Stop the games. This isn't a show. We've been through this policy like six times. Either vote for it or don't. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. Ms. McDougall, did you want to speak to it? Mr. Susan, to you for follow-up? Yeah, I still don't have a reason of why we are reducing um, other than staff's time and abuse, which I disagree with. Um, I would come back uh, to Ms. Campbell's point, specifically saying that um, you're given more time. The idea is, is that if you want to speak to the agenda, you're given three minutes. But the individuals who want to speak to a non-agenda item that are coming in are only given one. So it's not like they can stand up for an agenda item and talk about a non-agenda item, then come over here and talk about a non-agenda item and the agenda item. If a person comes because they're passionate about an issue, they are restricted in the time period that they have. We still have not been given a time period uh, or a reason why this is the way it is. Again, staff time and abuse. Um, the other thing is, is that you know, the, the, the period that you're saying from cutting that, it, it, to me, that's absurd. The other piece is, is that someone, gamesmen show everything. I have been against this ever since we sat down and those bus drivers couldn't speak. That got me. And so from that point on, I realized we were doing something. And yes, there was a point where we said we should move to this because of the way that we were feeling, because we were going through these huge meetings. But after I sat down and I started looking at it, the people, Miss Ramsey, bus drivers, everybody else, it consistently gives me the thought that these people need to speak. And the idea that these people could have spoken tonight and the time before, they won't be able to speak to the three minutes when it does come a time where there's a lot of people here. So they're going to come here when more than 20 or more than 30 people end up coming, and they're not going to be able to give their speech. Their time that they came here to speak before us. And if we have to sit here for a couple extra minutes, an hour, two hours extra, it doesn't hurt us. It doesn't hurt us to just allow people to sit at the podium and speak for an extra two minutes. It doesn't hurt the abuse, and we're going to be here over our debates anyway. So that I, I rest. Thank you. Anyone else requesting follow-up? Right. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Nay. The motion passes 4-0. Four four All right. Doc, I'm sorry, 4-1. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mullins, will you please let us know about items under the action portion of the plan? Yes, Madam Chair. The first item is H31, procurement solicitations. We have a motion. Move to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. Dougal. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. Motion passes five. Dr. Mullins. The next item is H32, Department School Initiated Agreements. Do I hear a motion? Move to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. Campbell. Is there discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any, uh, any opposed, same sign? Passes 5-0. All right, we will now move on to the information agenda, which includes items for board review and may be brought back for action at a subsequent meeting. No action will be taken on these items tonight, Dr. Collins. There are two items under the information category. Does any member wish to? either All right that's going to bring us board member reports and discussion points we had two items added to this category the first is from Ms. McDougall on the SHAC committee updates Ms. McDougall sure thank you so I want to I'm a member of the uh, school health advisory committee and a lot of good things came out of that one they were presenting the wellness report for the schools elementary and secondary and they look at, this, at these reports of health and nutrition and physical activity. And we really did very well. So they have these every year. There is some data that's probably on the website of the Health Advisory um, Committee. And also, we also had um, a Mr. Reed come and speak to the health care. I know we had a lot of issues with the form. When the new bill came out about uh, health care, do you want your um, student to be seen in the clinic or not seen in the clinic? And so we're revising that form as we speak. Um, and so 
his, what, Mr. <laughs> what Mr. Reed was saying is it's kind of like a catch-22 because he has questions and when they go, he goes up there and he asks the Department of Health, they say, oh no, that the bill doesn't fall underneath us. So then he goes to the Department of Education regarding the health um, and they say, well, that's not ours either. So he feels like he's going in circles on that, but we are going ahead with a form that should be clear for all of our parents. And um, I'm wondering, is Chris, is that form, there we go. Uh, Ms. Ms. Moore, is that form going to be posted someplace, or how is that form going to be delivered or looked at? Thank you. So that was part of our meeting. Um, and then there, one of the last presentations was very interesting to me. It was called Vision Zero. And it is championed with the Space Coast Transportation and the Sheriff's Department and um, some other departments in our county. And basically, it's an initiative to bring down the deaths of pedestrians. So it's um, a very big campaign. They're looking at uh, pedestrian safety, traffic safety. Um, they're looking at it as a whole problem. Um, they're working with builders. Um, they're looking at how do we eliminate traffic fatalities. So that's their goal here. And they're very partnered with us. They um, help sponsor uh, the school walk and ride, um, the crossing guards. They celebrate crossing guards, National School Bus Safety Week. So they do a lot for us in the schools. So it was a very full meeting. Um, there will be a new web page soon for this um, School Health Advisory Committee. Um, it's going to look really nice. It's in the process. It's not there yet. So that was the meeting of the School Health Advisory Committee. May I speak to that? So Ms. McDougall, um, one of the things I did about four years ago is I called together all of the entities that are in charge of the uh, crossing guard. Right, because we had a student in my district that was off Post Road that was killed um, in a traffic accident. And what they laid out was some of the um, scariest situations because there are some school areas where four-way drives are, 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 our crossing guards are like dodging traffic, right? And it has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with the department or the, the city or municipality they're in. It has everything to do with the Department of Transportation. We have many areas inside of our school district where easy things like putting lights around stop signs, no start, no turn on reds, all of those things are, are possible. And the problem is, is that the DOT is on like a four-year freaking lag. So in particular, Croton and O'Galley Boulevard is one of the worst and well-known. Kids are, I mean, it is scary there all the time. And so what I did was I got this group together, they made recommendations, and I went to the DOT meeting, and they said, well, that's great, we'll put a study together. And I said, well, how long that'll take? They said about two years. So I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I drove up to the DOT up in DeLand, and I walked through past the secretary, walked right into the director's office, and I said, you are going to fix this. And they started moving quicker. I called Debbie Mayfield, who at the time was the head of transportation, and we went that route. That is a huge thing. So whatever you need our help from, let me know. It is, it is irresponsible that a DOT would move as slow as they do that would then possibly put our kids in danger. So whatever process you're putting together, Godspeed, and get it done as fast as possible. We should all be a part of that because there are some things that are, that are really scary in our district. I, there's one thing that um, surprised me out of talking with um, people from Vision Zero, because I don't know if anyone else noticed it, um, noticed it or had this happen, but we have pedestrians who don't use crosswalks, and all of a sudden, whether they have the right of way or not, they kind of just walk in front of your car. And I said, do we have a jaywalking law? We do not have jaywalking laws here in the state of Florida. So just so you know, if you're driving, you need to yield for these people, but I think most of us would anyhow. But um, I was very surprised we did not have a jaywalking law. One of the things that I know our health, our groups do is you have those midpoint blocks who um, a lot of our students are not aware of. We've had students that have been killed because of midpoint. Mine was, mine was a post student, and having the education from the transportation and the 
face Chris transportation department across the street and these entities is going to be key because kids don't understand they just walk right out into traffic they don't those midpoint blocks if anybody knows anything about them the lights turn on but half the drivers don't even know what that means so they go through it and the kids they don't pay attention so what ends up happening is they just literally walk out and we've lost children because of this and it's not our fault and it what it is is just the educating our children so that's a and great commitment and our public and our public yeah. kids yep. so thank you that's yep so i have a question uh, so it's like, and I, is that the that's the document that the, the health advisory produced correct and is that something that gets posted is i know i've someone asked me about it in an email way back and i i searched one the only one i could find was like an older one but do we um how can people access that this yeah. one All right, so for the people who didn't hear you because you weren't on the microphone, um, the, so she said go to the district website and then under um, food nutrition services um, is where you would ac access that. And I believe it's under wellness policy. There it is. Yep. So I would like to do that. All right, thank you, Ms. Mazzoul. Um, anyone else have anything on the health committee? All right, then I think Ms. Campbell, you had the next request for discussion at large. I did, so um, in, it's been in the news. I haven't had anybody approach me necessarily, but it's been in the news that um, the county commissioners, um, the Charter Review Commission has been looking into all things relating to the county and the, one of the things that we're looking at is um, how we do school board elections in Brevard um, years ago it, it's this is my understanding just having heard um, one of the members of the committee or Mr. Tredis um, said that suggested that when the Charter Review Commission made school board single district um, oh, sorry I'm looking single district elections, right, that they didn't do it in the correct way because um, state law said the way to do that is you either have to have the school board put forth the resolution to the county um, to vote um, or you had to have it do it by the petition process. Um, of course, it's been that way for 24 years, 22, 24 years, something like that. Um, but uh, I thought we'd have the opportunity. Um, it was suggested that we as a school board could do something about that. It gave us, would give us an opportunity to maybe have um, Paul do a little more research. I, I asked him to do that last week, and I know he's been working on it. It's not complete, because um, it involves uh, several different things as to what our options are, but we um, would have the option, uh, actually that's probably the most likely way for it to happen, um, to, for the community to leave it the way that it has been um, for all these years. Um, but to make sure that it's done in the in the correct way if that's necessary. And so I don't know, Mr. Gibbs, if you had any updates that you would share or thoughts uh, initially? No, not at this time, but uh, if the board provides consensus to uh, if it wants to continue with single member districts for sure, and it, the research vets out that I need to do something, I'm happy to prepare a resolution to bring to you before the cutoff date. Okay. And since that's something that we're likely to be talking about over the next couple of months, um, I know the cutoff date is, I think it's August 22nd have, right. for the supervisor of elections. Right, so, so we'd have to vote for then. Um, just would suggest for the public who's thinking about it, um, it's not anything that would affect this year's election um, because you know, it would be something we'd have to be voted on, be by, voted the on by the public. Um, but it's, you know, I think um, different counties across Florida do it different ways. Um, certainly, there are some districts in Florida that have um, uh, county-wide elections. And just to explain, uh, or just to make sure we all under, on, are on the same page, 
state law requires, in order to be a school board member, you have to be a registered voter, and you have to live in the district. So that doesn't change. Every county in Florida, every school board member is supposed is required to live in within the boundaries of their district. Um, but some counties can have um, countywide elections, right? So rather than only a school board member running in their district, they'd actually have to be going for the voters of the whole entire county. Uh, personal opinion, I think that really disenfranchises people from smaller communities um, because then rather than their vote counting as a certain percentage um, of you know, just the 90,000-ish voters from their district, now their, their vote is shrunk down to a much smaller percentage of the hundreds of thousands that are in the county. So, um, but we need to be hearing from our public. Now's the time for people to be sending us emails, letting us know. Um, it's, it's a huge um, cost, and somebody has suggested that it brings in you know, it would maybe bring in the extra influence of um, you know, special interest groups or whatever to do the funding because, you know, and I, I'm just, just throwing this out there again, just personal opinion. I would say what's good for the goose is what is good for the gander. Uh, and so I would suggest that our friends across the street um, might want to take a look at doing the same thing for themselves um, of having countywide county commissioner elections if they want to do school board because we all make decisions for the whole county when it comes to schools, and they all make decisions for the whole county when it comes to the county commissioners. So um, I just, it's now's the time for people to let their voices be heard um, on this issue. And, um, but I do think that if, if it's necessary, I think I, if the board would, if there's any kind of consensus, Madam Chair, that we would ask Mr. Gibbs to go ahead and continue his research um, into what we might need to do and what that might look like. Uh, in the next, in the coming months, months, because we do have a deadline if we're going to get out to the voters this November. I have something to talk on it, Mr. Um, Paul. Are we currently in violation of our redistricting that we should have done last year? No, we're uh, we got a plan to do redistricting in the next odd year, long term, but uh, we are not. But currently, we are out of compliance from our district. No, we're, you have to be out of compliance. You have to be significantly over ten percent. We are at like ten point something percent. Uh, from the smallest to the largest. So we are within the realm of doing it so that I did not feel comfortable asking this board to rush redistricting the districts at the end of the year last year, given the uh, short time frame from when we received the census data. We could have, one of the proposals that was made was to mirror the county commission that we could have done off of their research, their voters, we would not have had to actually pay for it. We were within, we are above 10% out. And that, the reason I bring that up is not to put you on the spot, Paul. We had talked about this before when I was making that recommendation. If you remember, I wanted to move towards the county commission so that we were not out of compliance for this issue, but it brings it right to the point. Um, there are good and bad things about single-member district. There are good and bad things about at-large district. And I think to have the conversation in depth about it, some of the points to bring. And one of the reasons that I bring this is that my major in, 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 in college was a dual major in history and political science my political science was in comparative government. So across the, the world, the comparative governments of at-large, of single member, of how the legislatures are all put together was what I majored in. So when you're looking at these, these issues, the, one of the single issues that happens more than ever in the single members is that it is the largest abuse of gerrymandering in the history of, of any of them. You gerrymander districts when you have single member districts, and our districts are gerrymandered. Our Rockledge is gerrymandered. Like it goes, my pockets go up and around, and what they were trying to do is grab population, okay? So there is case law after case law after case law that shows that when people bring forward to try to stop at-large districts, what they're ended up doing is, is they said, well, because the at-large districts disenfranchises the minorities, stuff like that, Romeo versus the city of Pomona, plaintiffs failed to establish any violation of the Voting Rights Act because the geographical compactness, minority group cohesion, they basically found that because you go to at-large does not signify that. And then what they actually brought forward, which is part of the studies at Florida State University, is that when you have a single member district, you are allowed to, car you, the majority, who ends up being the majority of an at-large district, carves up the district so that they can use gerrymandering to stay in control. So it's not like, so, so, the good thing about single member districts is that you do exactly what you said. It's great at having that direct representation. But 
it is not the best system. Um, one of the things that they have right now is Pinellas and Lee have a combination of both. We have, they have, Pinellas and Lee have five single member districts, and then they have two at large districts, which makes, which gives the both of them. And what they found, I mean, case law after case law after case law has found in favor of there is no discrimination in the at large districts because of the variations of, so they said that African Americans would all vote one way or the other, and then they go to do the study and they find out that in certain elections, African Americans vote one way or the other. They don't always vote for a Democrat. And the same thing on the other side. So the variations in the way that the elections are held throws off the idea that you can discriminate. And actual discrimination occurs more in single member districts. But it's good because you can relate directly to the schools. So one of the things that I would love to bring forward um, is to, to try to put in two extra districts that are at large. I think it would cover both sides. And there's literally other school districts within the state of Florida that actually do that, Pinellas and Lee. So if we're going to be asking Paul to look forward towards putting something together, those would be two things that we can do. It, 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 it stops off the gerrymandering. It carves out discrimination. Um, the redistricting that we have to do every 10 years on single member districts is a problem. So like there's good and bad to both sides, but to sit back and say that, you know, one side is better than the other, I think it's a, it, we should pause for a minute and um, take a look at that. So with that, that would be my recommendation is to bring forward one that, and that brings two general, two of those together. Because otherwise the majority will always carve out of majority and that's how it'll always be. That's it. Mr. Gibbs, do you want to say something? You were looking no, like you no, were. No, I'm, I'm just ready if there's another question. But. I have a question. Uh, it's been a really long time. Quite frankly, I don't even um, But I do remember getting the numbers of our district with the, um, correct me if I'm wrong here because I'm literally doing this memory, but weren't ours more evenly distributed? I don't remember the numbers. Off the top of my head, and I did not, I did not pay attention in the county yes. commission numbers. So okay, so when we were presented that information, we were more uh, even than the county commission before they, before they. Um, and when we were having that discussion, the question that was posed wasn't just mirror the county commission; it was to mirror the county commission before we even knew what they were going to do. Um, something. So, um, I just wanted to clarify that. Which also would have unseated it. Of us. Two of us. Right. You can't live, live outside of your district. In the county. Yeah. Correct. Um, and the other thing that I want to say too to that That's is true. mirroring the county commission also yeah. then gives the power to the county commission to then do exactly what you just discussed, gerrymander it, because they are district based. They're not countywide. So um, personally, I I don't really care about this. I don't think there's anything wrong with you asking him to research it because you care about it and he works for you too. <laughs> Um, but I have no opinion either way, honestly. I, I'm with you on the disenfranchising of voters. I don't see the benefit of it. Um, again, I, I'm not knowledgeable enough of the process of what happened here because I was probably like 10 years old when this happened. But I'm pretty sure the voters made the ultimate decision to change it, right? The voters of Brevard? Yeah, the voters would have had to approve the uh, Charter Commission provision that got added i think it was 1999. right so they so the voters of brevard county decided ultimately to, the voters did vote correct so um i just want people to remember that piece too because people keep <laughs> presenting it as if it was just the charter review committee that made this decision but ultimately went to the voters it sounds like they didn't go through the right process but the voters ultimately had a voice into making that decision so just want to remind everybody of that just thank you you've mm -hmm. not yet spoken would you like to i, I do i i am Curious about Mr. Susan's um, thought about having two at large. Can can is that something we can look at, Mr. Yeah. Gibbs? Is that I don't know how that would work yeah, or what you, needs to be done. It would be a change that you'd have to take again to the voters. So if that's something the board want is interested in, I'm certainly happy to look at it. I haven't specifically looked at it. And I know districts do it. Uh, in addition to the ones Mr. Susan mentioned, I know Broward does it, and uh, some of the larger districts have at large seats as well as single member seats. I was just curious. I thought I don't think it. I, I would just like more information because I think it might change. It's um, more representative of, you know, I mean, your county and stuff like that. Um, I'd like to respond real quick. Um, we made the. I was making the motion. the The comment was made that uh, we didn't know what they were going to do before we decided to go with them. The argument that was made 
um, when it was back then was that one of the issues we have with multiple districts is that we are we have a uh, supervisor of elections where there are certain people that might be in one district per county, another district number per, per school board. So the idea was is that if we were to come together and mirror the county, it would be better for the voters. It would save money for the supervisor of elections and time. It would reduce the amount of precincts. There was a huge amount of positives to do that. And there are many other districts inside the state of Florida that do that specifically for it. People know D4 is this, D4 is this. Um, that was one of the reasons. And saying that we didn't know it before, they didn't know it before, but the idea was that we would work together. And we didn't have to do it because it's ultimately our choice in the end. The county commission, the other comment that was made that the county commission would then have control over what we do, no, we would have a voice in that process and then we would agree to it or disagree to it. But the idea was is that I was trying to come together because we are still out of compliance and here we are going into another election where we have an imbalance of representation inside the county. The other issue that was mentioned that was said that, that two of us would be outseated, that's just not true either. The bottom line is, is that if you look at case law and how it's put together, I said that I was not rerunning. That would put two people, Ms. Jenkins, you inside the, the actual district, and there's no other competition. And there are other laws that have been put into place when they move to things like this to resolve that. But that was the, the comment that, that it would unseat us was not true, that the county commissioner which would, would set our districts, that's not true because we still have the voice. And then the comment that said that we knew before, we were worked together on a solution together for the betterment of the voters of the county. To have precincts that are the same, to have districts that are the same, works out real well. And that was the sentiment from the other side. Steve Christofoli, the chair, other people I had reached out to to find out if this was an idea that they would support. And they said that's great for governance. Didn't have anything to do with who, I mean, for me, to be able to take voters and say, we put you before us to make an argument that we're going to be put in the same district and that's not fair. Well, what's not fair is to the voters to not know which one of the districts that they are. And that's it. I have to respond to that. Nobody said it's not fair. Mr. Susan, you're completely misquoting exactly what Ms. Campbell and I are saying. It is literally stated that you cannot redistrict and have a sitting member get moved from that district. You can't just magically have an election the next day after you redistrict those districts. So saying that the, the next time you can just run for the other seat, that's not how that works. I had a four-year term. Ms. Katie has a four, or Ms. Campbell has a four-year term. When you redistrict, it doesn't magically just turn into you can just run for the other seat. That's just not how it works. And to be quite honest, it's frustrating to me when people have been sitting on this board for multiple years and they haven't had any of these issues and seem to have these issues over the past six years, but they have them now. Mr. Gibbs, I have a question for you. When it comes to the county commission working together with us, if we decided to go that route and mirror what they're doing, do they have any legal obligation to allow us to participate in that if we decided to mirror what they did? If we were just adopting their boundaries, we'd be adopting it. They could choose to work with us. They have no legal obligation to right. give us a say. And so I just want to make that very clear. Um, the majority of us, did not feel comfortable giving that power over to another governing body who doesn't technically sit above us, we cannot just assume that they would work with us on something like that. Um, and again, I'm just going to make it really, really clear. I'm glad that you were admitting you weren't going to run again. I'm curious when you're leaving. Uh, but I'm not running again either. So no, Ms. it has Belfort, nothing to do that with that. That is completely I don't care. Inappropriate. I can say what I want to say. You just it's said. Completely you inappropriate. You just said that right, I made a statement. It is unfair. That is completely inappropriate. It's not on it. That's in completely inappropriate. So I'm going to make a request, Gordon. This clearly is going down the wrong path. If you all have questions for Paul on the process or the options, please get them to him so he can know what it is and we can revisit this conversation focused on the issue at hand <coughs> when we convene during our board check-in or during our, our next workshop whenever. Um, if Mr. Gibbs doesn't have the research, you know, by the, that's a fast turnaround for the check-in, but um, when he's prepared for us to have that discussion with the fact. Okay. Are there any additional board discussion items for this evening before we move into our non-agenda public comment? I had two things. Mr. Susan. Um, first off is, is that um, I wanted to let everybody know that every year the veterans groups come forward with 
um, they come forward with like essays and they come forward with all these different issues that they're trying to get into our schools. And because they don't understand the education system, they bring an essay like in March for our students to write and they get like five people to respond because the issue is, is that um, it's not appropriate at the time, we're testing, we're trying to get stuff done and it's just not there. So I'm gonna call a veteran all group. Um, I was the Veterans of Foreign Wars National Teacher of the Year. Um, I'm gonna try to use that as, hey, let's get back together. Let me talk to you guys about your scholarships that you guys are trying to write, helping bring them towards um, at an appropriate time and write it as an appropriate um, scholarship essay, right? If they're writing the essay that is tied in with something that is going on inside of our government during that time, then the teachers would be able to voluntarily have the students write the essay in class as they're writing prompt. That's an easy thing to do. But otherwise, they're just they're trying to come in. And I, and I think being honored for some of the veterans things that we do around here, being in Veterans County, um, we were just named number two in the na or top three in the nation for veteran living by the, the armed services. I don't know if anybody knows that. But I think it, it would do it. So I'm going to call them together. I'm going to work. Um, I talked to Dr. Mullins a little bit about it today. Um, see if there's some way that we can take those and integrate them so that we, they can get more responses, but they're not impacting in a negative way on our school system. Um, each one of them, like Veterans of Foreign Wars, MOAC, and all of them, um, they may be able to put them into ROTC or something like that, but just collaborating with them was all. I just wanted to kind of give you guys the heads up. And then the other thing is, is that, um, I, I know you guys know this, but when we built the Vieira Elementary School, we put in a lactation uh, room, right? And we got it a big award by the lactation consultants. Um, they are big supporters of ours, and we are leading in that. Um, what I would like to do is part of the Thrive by Five that Dr. Mullins did um, I wanted to package it a little bit more. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is talk about making sure that inside of our district, we do set aside an area for breastfeeding mom. We do have, we want to make sure that our policies and procedures with teacher leave and all the other pieces are solidly put together and notify them of how to get their short-term disability and all that stuff. So I'm going to kind of put that together. I'm going to ask individuals to help me on the project to to try to you know put together because there are so many people in our district that in that have children and go through some struggles and I'd like to try to package that up. I'm, I've had three children in the last five years and I'd like to um, to do that. So, so just giving you guys a heads up. Thank you, Mr. Susan. Any other board members have discussion items for this evening? Dr. Mullins, do you have anything for discussion? All right, that is going to move us into our non-agenda speakers. We'll now hear the remaining speakers who signed up to comment on non-agenda items. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. We have a clock in front of me to help you keep track of your time. When your time is over, you'll be asked to stop and allow the next speaker his or her turn. We'll hear from the speakers in the order in which they signed up, including those, we have no one waiting outside, I don't think. Uh, stated earlier, reasonable decorum is expected at all times and your statement should be directed to the board chair. Should audience participation interfere with the speakers being heard or hearing me, I will be forced to clear the room. When I call your name, please line up along the east wall of the boardroom to facilitate the smooth transition of speakers. I'm actually just going to go ahead and call all five because we only have five. Um, before ple speaking, please state your name, the organization you represent, if any, and identify the topic you'll be discussing. So we have Katie Delaney, Sarah Mursky, Matthew Woodside, Bernard Bryan, and Crystal Casey. Good evening, board. I have um, more to say about public comment. Um, one of the board members mentioned how, how we get many minutes to speak and that we should be pretty much be happy with that. And I feel that that is completely wrong. And if any of you believe that we should be limited to share our grievances to you, our elected representatives, that is wrong. You are at a very local level where lots of community issues come up. Like I was stating before, there are kids being assaulted in schools. There are kids walking into bathrooms with other children having, you know what I'm about to say, all sorts of things are going on in the bathrooms. 
And this is happening in middle schools, not just high schools. I even heard the other day about a sixth grader. And now we have to fight with you guys about not wanting porn in the libraries. You all have the authority to pull these books out of the schools. You all have that authority right now. We are not allowed as parents to come into our school and have lunch with our kids, yet two pedophiles were hired and working at a middle school in Brevard County Public Schools this year. But we're the security risk? We should have as many minutes as we need to tell you our grievances and communicate and talk it out until we figure out all of these problems that we have in school. Because honestly, you people, not just you guys, but previous boards for decades have, have had control of our schools with little parent input at these board meetings. And look at where we are now. Suicide rates are through the roof. Bullying is out of control. Children getting raped. Pedophiles in our schools. Yet I am the security risk. You should all resign. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delaney. Great evening. Mars. Good evening, Madam Chair and Board. My name is Sarah Mursky. I'm not representing any organization. I'm representing myself. Um, I am a taxpayer constituent voter of two children in Brevard Public Schools. I am a student of psychology. Um, I wanted to address a couple of things that were said tonight, the policies you voted on, and an outside concern. Um, first of all, with um, a media specialist committee or a library committee, I fully believe that that should stay a board committee and not a superintendent committee, and here's why. Board committees have to abide by Sunshine State laws. Superintendent committees do not have to, so we don't know what's happening. The public doesn't know what's happening in, um, in the superintendent committees, and I like things to be in the sunshine. I like abiding by the law. Um, the other thing that I have brought to this board before is issues with the registration packet that talks about how if I sign no on first aid, some sort of first aid care that my child, will, my children will not receive uh, life-saving care if something were to happen on school grounds. Um, but yet there's a conflicting um, scenario with that from what we hear from our EMT and our firefighters. So I think that ne that needs to be addressed as we're reg registering our children for uh, next year in the fall. Um, the other thing I want to address, the clear bias from the dais, uh, Madam Chair, I watched you allow speakers to um, go on, address the audience, the parents, without correcting that, and yet I watched you uh, reprimand other speakers. That wasn't equal. It wasn't equal uh, treatment. There was no equity in it. I also watched you do it on the board level as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcy. Matthew Woodside. Uh, good evening. My name is Matthew Woodside, and I've been an educator with Brevard Public Schools for the last 15 years. Uh, this is the third time I've spoken to the board this year because I really do love my kids, all of my kids. And as I've stated at this podium twice before, this district's policies allow for students to use restrooms and locker rooms of the opposite sex. And I think it's important that we continue this conversation um, and talk about the results of the policies in place. So let me talk about a couple of those. Uh, recently, a teacher in our district reached out to me to let me know of a troubling situation that took place in his school that demonstrates just how dangerous the results of these policies really are. This teacher was forced by our policies to let a female student, who was identified as male, into the male locker room, where this student proceeded to change her clothes in the main changing area in front of her male classmates and PE teacher. And when this student took her shirt off, 
this male PE teacher and his male students witnessed that she was not wearing any undergarments under her shirt. That's right. This female student was completely exposed from the waist up in the middle of the boys' locker room. These boys saw her, and the male PE teacher in charge of supervision saw her. This happened. And if it happened in the boys' locker room, it can happen in the girls' locker room. This district's policies are forcing teachers to be uh, in the presence of possible nude minors of the opposite sex and to expose our students to the same. What are we even talking about, guys? Like, this is for real. This is considered That's criminal right. in any other context. And yet, if I refuse to let it happen, I'm threatened with losing my job. These policies are being written by people who either have a twisted view of what's good for kids or they lack the courage to do what's right. Either one should be a disqualification for service. This district says they're just following federal law, but St. John's County recently released their new guidance on these issues, which states what many of us have known for a long time, quote, there is no specific federal or uh, Florida state law that requires schools to allow a transgender student access to the locker room corresponding to their consistently asserted transgender identity, end quote. So enough with the smoke screens, enough with the excuses. It's time for this district to get honest. Let's be explicitly clear. The source of our locker room policies is not the federal government. The, the responsibility lies solely with you. We accommodate whenever we can for kids to be safe and feel comfortable. When accommodation infringes upon the rights of other students, accommodation has become oppression. This district is oppressing kids, and it's time that you are held uh, accountable. It's time for this nonsense to stop, and it's time for these policies to end. And it's time for people of courage of this community to take a stand and demand that our elected officials protect the good of our kids or find another job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Woodside. Audience, please hold your applause. Mr. Bryan. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak tonight. It's past my bedtime, so I'm not going to be long. <laughs> I just want to say uh, a couple of days ago, a couple of nights ago, I received a text message from a parent. And the parent said, Mr. Bryan, thank you for helping my child. My child is having difficulty reading, and I'm even having difficulties as a parent. Thank you for taking the time to help. And I just want to say, um, I'd like to thank many people that is on this leadership team. Um, Dr. Mullins, thank you for your support. Uh, Mrs. Klein, very nice lady. Thank you for your support. Mr. Bryan, hold on just one second. I'm stopping your time for you, okay? Okay. I just want to reinforce that all comments need to come to the oh, board just chair so that we're, I, I know you're not, you're yeah, not saying not, anything negative, just if you could keep it okay. within all the, right. thank you, sir. All right. I just got to keep my head this way, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, Dr. Sullivan, thank you for your support. Uh, Ms. Christine. Ms. Mr. Bryan, I'm sorry. I hate to keep interrupting you. I'm not taking your time away, and I know you're I'm ready to get at home. I'm my notes. I know. I know you're ready to get home to bed, um, but I need you to, so we don't allow people to be named individually, oh. whether it's positive or negative. Oh, wow. Um, just just as, as part of the policy, so if you could just keep it, maybe keep it general, and if you'd like to, like, drop an email to those people individually. Oh, wow. That would be helpful. Okay. okay, thank you. I wasn't aware of that. I apologize. That's I've, okay. I've called names before. It's okay. Um, but I, I, I do like to recognize some of those. Um, you know, to the leadership team here, we've gotten tremendous support. Um, you know, many times I've called and I, I didn't receive quick response. But I want those people to know um, that we as a community partner really appreciate that. But one of the things I want to keep focus on, and I know there's been a lot of issues that you've heard tonight, one of the things I want this board to keep in mind, that there are over 4,000 students at risk that are one to two grade level behind in reading. There are at least 4,000 to 5,000 students at risk that are behind in math. What a, that's a tragedy. So I, you know, I know there's a lot of discussions on a lot of things, but I really want this board to be focused toward closing the achievement gaps. That is so significant for our children. I really want you to, to focus on a little bit 
the disproportionate of disciplinary referrals. That is a tremendous issue. So those people that are in leadership position that have worked with me, I'm not going to call any names, uh, they are in this room tonight. I want you to know I really appreciate you getting back with me, working with me. You know who you are. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. And I also want you to keep in mind the diversity gap that, is, that we face in this district. And we saw some good things tonight, but we're not there yet. So please continue to, I always tell my child to stay focused. I know there's a lot of noise, so stay above the noise because I'm watching your data. I was up four o'clock this morning looking at it. So please, ma'am and please, sir, keep in mind those three things. Diversity gaps, uh, diversity needs, uh, discipline gaps. Thank you, Mr. Bryan. I know, I got confused with this stuff, sorry. It's all good. You're good. Thank you so much. Crystal? Good evening, Madam Chair and Board. Once again, good evening. I plan for one minute. So I'm surprised that I have three. Um, I would like to ask a question before I start. The information that I have here contains some names of contacts that have been emailed, am I permitted to use those names or not? Um, I, ideally, no. But I mean, if, you, if it's, you're just saying I've reached out to staff member, then absolutely. So I am permitted to state the names of those that I've contacted in regard to the issues. It would be better if you addressed positions as opposed to individuals. OK, I'll revise. On March 4th, 2022, I requested assistance from principal at Vieira High School regarding concerns I have about the Vieira High School Hawks RBI club practices, finances, and ethics. The principal of Vieira High School included several members on the emails and our superintendent in her investigation. The principal of Vieira High School repeatedly denied emailing me her investigation discovery. She further stated her refusal to consent to have an in-person meeting recorded. The principal of Vieira High School gave an ultimatum that a verbal meeting or phone call occur in order for me to receive her investigation findings. There was another individual within the BPS department that was copied on all of these emails, including our superintendent, that stated that private meetings, video recordings are not permitted. This individual did not respond to my email April 6th, asking the specific BPS policy disallowing an audio recording of a meeting so long as all parties consent. There has been no resolution to this matter with the Vieira High School Hawks RBI Club <coughs> investigation, and therefore, this shall serve as notice of intent to escalate this to the Florida Department of Education for further review and through the complaint process. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes our non-agenda speakers this evening. The board wishes to thank you for your time and your willingness to speak. Um, anything that we, Dr. Mullins? Madam Chair and members of the board, I would like to provide the board and the community uh, two clarifying statements referenced to, to uh, information that was presented tonight by public speaker. One, uh, Brevard Public School staff uh, are not prohibited and would never uh, withhold emergency life-saving care for a student who is experiencing such a situation regardless of a registration form, that type of thing. We would certainly um, always respond to a student who would need life-saving care, and we uh, would follow through with that. Second, the book review committee is a committee required to meet in the sunshine, and that is explicitly stated in the policy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mullins. Um, and uh, for clarity, I'm the one who made the comment earlier about the superintendent being able to convene additional committees if necessary. 
And that doesn't mean that it's the superintendent's committee. It means that the superintendent can say to his staff, we need more committees to deal with this, and they can convene the committee via the policy. So I think that's uh, important delineation. The other thing that I would say, and um, so one of the frustrations that, uh, that we have with some of the things that are said during public comment is oftentimes we get lots of generalities about which we can do nothing. Um, on multiple occasions, I have reached out either at the end of public comment, I have asked for follow-up for the specifics on concerns that have been shared. I have had email communication with individuals to follow up on things that are brought up in public comment. The reality is that generalities don't help any of us to do anything about the issue. And there were several statements made tonight that I think we just absolutely have to address. And that is that we have pedophiles working in our schools, that we have children getting raped in our schools, that it, it is incredibly frustrating to have those suggestions made and not have a good venue for appropriately responding to them. And so what I will say to our public in general, and board, if you disagree with me saying this on your behalf, please feel free to let me know. But I think we can all agree, there is no one sitting up here and no one sitting in the back of the room that isn't here because they are committed to doing the best thing for children. However, we can't do anything about generality. We can't do anything about saying kids are having fights in the bathroom. Kids have had fights in the bathroom since I was in kindergarten. We now have social media, which makes it much more prevalent. And I'm not saying that it's not worse or it's not better, but to suggest that there are all of these sources that people have and then not provide sources is not helpful. So if there are issues that need to be addressed, my request is that we work collaboratively to address those issues, but we need the specific. We can't send staff on a hunt to find where these specific things are occurring. And as I've said before, with regard to public comment, and it's been thrown back in our face multiple times, when I say this is not the place for a two-way conversation, it's not ideal for a two-way conversation. And that's why, I'm not trying to silence anyone from speaking, but many of the issues are much more complicated than can be addressed right here in this boardroom, in a public forum, where everything's being recorded and we can't have names mentioned because you might be accusing someone who is completely innocent of something. So I, and I would suggest all of my fellow board members, welcome you to reach out to us with specifics on concerns so that we can resolve them instead of having things being spread publicly that sound accurate without any details to support them. Ms. McDougall, go. No, so you, are, sorry, yeah. you are fine. Go right ahead. Um, Ms. Moore? Oh, I turned it off. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Ms. Stephen. Ms. Moore, could we, is it all right if I talk about the new form that we're developing for the health checklist? Because I, I think people are, they're worried about our old form. Like I said, it's an old form. It was like a yes or no. We are developing now a new form that's going to be a checklist, correct? Correct. The new health consent form, the HB 1557 specifically says we need to delineate every category of service that are, is offered in our clinics and give parents the option to check yes or no for each of those categories. We went to the, the uh, exactly what you were talking about before, Ms. Campbell, that that health uh, plan, and we went through and said, okay, what are all the categories of services that we offer in the clinic to start drafting out that form? And in the meantime, we spoke to Mr. Gibbs to say, get us some information from what other schools are doing, other districts are doing. And we are waiting for that to be, um, to go up, like all rulemaking, through the Department of Education to do rulemaking and come back down to us. Oh, that so, takes time, right, that's what I'm afraid and of. the law goes into effect on July 1st. So we are going to do the best we can. To reiterate uh, Dr. Mullen's point, 
emergency services are never in question uh, if a child needs emergency services. Um, and we'll get a form out there, and unfo unfortunately for the public, when rulemaking happens, we might have to change the form. Um, but I, Ms. Mursky, Ms. Mursky, that's Ms. Mursky. Ms. Mursky, can you please follow up with her after the meeting or with one of us, okay, Ms. Moore? Uh, so we might have to redo the form again. So we will be bringing you uh, something, a form to look at. It'll go to Dr. Mullins. It'll go to the cabinet. Uh, you guys will see it. It'll go out, and we might be coming back again to the table after rulemaking is done with the Department of Education. But it should be a very much more specific form. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Having no further business, this meeting is now adjourned. Have a great night.